All right, all right. Welcome to this next episode of the Victory Podcast, where we explore life, leadership, and journey. I'm here with a great friend and teammate from this past year's Race Across America, Corinna Coffin. Corinna is a registered dietitian and a um, obstacle course athlete across like all the genres. She's done Spartan races, Tough Mudder. She does um, CrossFit games. You name it, she's done it all. And you know, with that thirst of competition she's had, she's working on getting her master's in sports and nutrition from the University of Utah. Uh, she's a great personality, super high energy, and all things positive. Corinna, thank you so much for joining us today. I can't wait to get into this conversation. How have you been? Thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be on here with you. And I've been good. Gosh, it's been, I feel like a million things have happened between now and last or this past summer when we were yeah it was july it was like july yeah (laughs) and that's it right so we we never i don't even know that i knew you existed until i landed in san diego took a short ride up to oceanside california and then we started getting the team ready for ram and so corinna was on the day shift i think she might have worked a little bit at both shifts because she had a tough job of feeding everybody on this race as well as working support on the backside um, but yeah, we yeah. got to meet at Oceanside, California, be on a part of the crew to work together to get that team across the country. And so what was that like for you? And how, how did you get involved with the Race Across America? For me, I was introduced by Monty, you know, an old teammate of mine that thought I was a good fit and I was an avid cyclist. And so how did you find your way to the team? So it was actually Mark, our, our fellow teammate, Mark James. Mark James, who, all right. Mark James. So he's been out here, obviously, in um, Coronado, and he's a... Um, a buds instructor and so we had met through he's crazy in his 50s and just crushing so crushing all these uh tough mutters and spartan races and so um when i was racing for that a battle frog uh obstacle course race back in the day before they went under they were spearheaded by a group of former navy seals and so um, mark came out to one of those events and that i was racing and we had crossed paths and we'd cross paths at several other races from that time. And it turns out he knows my brother. And so we ended up, um, I, I, it was, it was so random, but I feel like one way or another, Mark introduced me to Mike Campbell, of team one mile. And I got pulled into that wonderful, um, leadership community. And when Mike reached out to me, I know we've talked about this on the trip a little bit of just how we all ended up joining together for that event. But I just, uh, I was everything I, I was, I was so leaning heavily towards just like, no, right. Because it, it's such a big commitment, like, a, you know, a seven actual days in and of itself to, um, Which, by know, the way, we didn't was, know it was going to be seven days. Like right, it, yeah, it, it, could been, been, it could have been nine. Yeah, ten. exactly. Yeah. So, you know, t- just, just to, um, you know, I guess in the grand scheme of things, like, I don't have as many responsibilities of, as many of you with like, you know, kids and all these other things going like a million different things going on um, at the time. And so like for me, even even without all those additional responsibilities, it just felt like a big commitment six months out to make that. I just wasn't sure um, where in the cards for me. So I was I remember just typing that message back to him and just being like, Gosh, I'm honored to be um, considered to be on the, like a member of the team. but. Um, you know, I just, I don't think I can, can commit to that this early out. And then, you know, I just stopped, I deleted it. And I was like, you know what, what if I said, what if I said yes, and actually gave this a try was on the other side of the competition floor as a, on a, as a support team member, um, and really tried, you know, it had a new experience, um, yeah. a completely new experience that I've ever had before. And so I, I said yes. And then we had these, you know, weekly calls and I was with, some worked with the other, um, our other dietitian, Kylie Van Horn and Natalie on just kind of coming up with a good plan of a course of action for feeding a a group of 25 plus individuals on the road in a bus (laughs) um, for seven plus days. And so I've never done anything like that. And it was an incredible experience with amazing people and um, it, t- it tested my abilities as a dietitian um, as well, just because, you know, you're you are fairly limited in that in that situation. Yeah, attention, Walmart shoppers, not a whole foods and or- organic, you know, nutritional. Oh, yeah. Walmart was the real MVP. Oh this 
this trip. But yeah, you, Natalie, and Kyle, you guys were like the trifecta of just like perfectness for what we needed because you guys were so adaptable. <clears throat> you know, what you guys had to be able to accomplish besides just feeding us all and working with the logistics and all those things, as well as keeping people motivated, hydrated well-rested and paying attention to all those needs. You guys were just phenomenal in there. And, you know, I, I don't know if I share with you. So for me, I went through a similar roller coaster. You know, Monty did the introduction. I met with Chris and Mike. And, um, you know, when I saw how the team was made up, I was like, man, this is amazing. And Monty is one of those old teammates of mine and friends. It's like, he's somebody you just don't say no to. And it's not because he's intimidating. It's because the guy <laughs> just like lives this larger than life type of lifestyle. And so when he's got something to offer you, it's usually worth biting onto and, and, and taking it on. And I'm, I'm so glad that I did. It was a tough season for me. You know, I lost my mom in March um, shortly after I committed to coming onto the team. And I had to organize things with the family to get them cared for. As you mentioned, I have kids and I'm a single dad to kind of take care of that. And then boom, we show up in Oceanside and it's like, check. All right. We've got a mission to complete here, you know, and it was everything from like, it was just like any other military operation where you understand the mission. Everybody's unified behind the same, you know, central purpose of getting these eight amazing people, you know, these athletes across the country as safely and as quickly as possible. And to watch us all with all the chaos going on and all the uncertainties, because none of us, there was, we had one previous ram experienced person on the team and that was ben and he had done um he had done like the two person or the four i think the four person team right, right. there's any other real ram experience on the team so we were all just sort of like figuring this out as we went and then before yeah. you know it whoop, the starting line goes and we're on the road and uh we're, up, we're coming up, you know, and, and I mean, major props to you, Bob, because you just and and we talked we talked about this a lot all throughout the trip, but just like the way you lead and just the calm demeanor in a very chaotic, you know, like with getting off course here and there, and like you have four vehicles that we're trying to coordinate with and people and and shift changes. It's like you know, it was amazing that we had so much support staff or crew on board but to be able to manage all that i mean i know obviously it was you it was chris it was yeah. mike um it certainly know, wasn't me like, i'm calm because i'm like oh let me you know, responsibility <laughs> here this is easy and like like what you had mentioned that was something that was intriguing to me is to work on sort of the support side you know of an operation you know i mean i've certainly worked the support side before as a seal helping other platoons or whatnot but like for a race event like this, where I'm typically like on the bike or doing the endurance to actually be in the car 12 hours a day, you know, and mm -hmm. coordinating all that stuff was, it was very fulfilling to me to be the cheerleader, yeah. to kind of be that person to help try and be that calm, collected voice and, you know, keeping people on track. It was really fun. Um, yeah. Fun. Yeah. There's something about, about contributing to the team. That's not, you know, you're not the direct focus as like the athlete, but you know, there's just, you, you, you just take in so much more from, you know, that other side, that experience of helping out and you become, you know, I, I think when it's, when you are the athlete, you're very internalized, right. With like things that like, you know, how, how are you performing and how, you know, what are your, um, like, what are the tasks that you need to be focusing on at hand? And what, when it, you're part of a larger team and on the support side of things, it's like, you've got a million different focuses and it's all external. It's like, how can I help in this way or this person in like observing and then jumping in and stepping in and just like, you know, uh, being ready at the drop of a hat to, to, to participate or, or do something for the, the common mission, right? The common for goal. Sure. So, and that entire yeah. team. I mean, that's why I consider them family because to the, the riders and the support folks all had a team first mentality. And that's what we teach at Victory Strategies, you know, my company. And um, man, to see it in live action, you know, something like the toughest bicycle race on the planet, you know, even with an eight person team, it is still, I mean, those people are dumping their souls on their 15, 20 minute segments, however long they were rotating through. Um, it was really inspiring. And so like, yeah. were there any like standout, um, you know, occurrences during RAM that you sort of either make you smile, chuckle, or you like reflecting back on or a growth, growth opportunity or all of those? Yeah, gosh, I mean, there's, there's, there's so many that make me smile. Um, <laughs> but I do think, I mean, it's, it's cool. I think the biggest thing with that experience was not really having, like, I'm a very visual person. And so like, the flow of the event, 
I didn't really have much of an idea of how that was going to work until we showed up, until we were doing the parking lot drills. What do you call the, the rock, rock drills? drills. Where yes. we, mm-hmm. The rock drills with Brad Penley. And, um, and then it was, it was finally starting to take shape in my mind of like, oh, okay, this is how it's going to work. So it's just funny thinking about like all the question marks on my head. Um, especially on the fueling side of things like, okay, how is this going to work? So like, like where, where, what do we need to have prepared? What, like, how many times are we going to be stopping all this? So it's just funny on the back side of it now, having, having gone through that whole experience, like knowing the flow of the flow of things and you know, what, what, what food we went through, what food we didn't go through, like, you know, how the shift changed. I think the biggest thing was just like, you know, feeding the athletes, but feeding the crew and making sure that, you know, food was the last thing on anyone's mind, you know, because they just knew it was taken care of. So, I mean, there's, there's always, I mean, from the fueling standpoint, there's, there's plenty of things, um, plenty of lessons learned, but I think the biggest thing, um, was, was just being a team player on like a very big team, but having like a very specific role on that team and trying to just trying to make being there to serve everyone else. And just like, how do I make everyone's, um, lives easier and, and it's hard when you're you know kind of stressed out or sleep deprived or you don't have a bed for a night and it's like uh, <laughs> and, and it's a seven day thing um so trying to like step out of yourself and like put you and your needs kind of like last and really like like you said mission first team first um but I really enjoyed our team circle ups at the end of each night, kind of our debriefs. He did a great job of leading that and sharing gratitude all throughout. And I think that really helped everyone stay grounded. Um, and just seeing like, you know, it's easy to get caught up in the little things throughout the day. So I just really appreciated that. Like, Hey, we just took a group of 25 strangers, put them all together. We're family here. We're having family dinner. We're in a bus. We're all, we're all wedged in the front half of this charter bus. And we're reflecting on all the things we're grateful for as a as a crew and those relationships built in just a short period of time yeah remarkable and one of my big takeaways well i wish not a takeaway just an observation of total appreciation was if you looked at the team the riders and the support there were no rock stars Mm -hmm. And, and i don't mean that that nobody was awesome everybody was awesome and i mean no rock stars is there was no one that was like carrying the load for everybody Everybody knew their roles and responsibilities and everybody, and this is what you look for in high performing teams is everybody can ratchet up a level if they need to, or ratchet down a level if they need to, based mm-hmm. on what mm-hmm. the team needs at the time. And that that's leadership, that's providing, you know, support, whatever that needs is, people understand it and it's not about ego. And I guess that's what I'm driving at, right? Is there was not ego on this this journey across the country. It couldn't be. Right. Like that would have, that would have killed would, the whole mission. Yeah, like, again, you know. The whole mission of the race was to spread that awareness for veteran suicide, you know, and helping them get the support and resources they need. Um, and that, that's yeah. what really got me into the race as, as well as to kind of support that mission. Um, and then some favorite memories for me was, I mean, you guys, I mean, we were probably the youngest team Ram has ever seen. You know, I had a call with the uh, director of the race a couple of weeks ago with, with dream and with Rachel. And he remarked about like how great the energy was, you know, I mean, I'm going to be 50 next year and we still, you know, we're like some of the, you know, Jutan's 53 and you girls and a lot of the racers were a bit younger and that energy was just awesome. And it was inspiring. And it's like, if you ask, especially folks like Monty and I, you know, Monty's a little bit younger than me, but when we look in the mirror, we don't see a 45 or 50 year old man. We see like, my gosh, for decades, it was still 25. I think now maybe I've matured a little bit and I'm willing to look at myself as like a 35 to 40 year old, maybe. It, let's just keep it 35. So when, so it's just like when you're in, in you know grade school, if you remember that analogy for kids, is that like if you take a fourth grader and you put him with a first grader, that first grader would typically like go up to like second or third grade and that fifth grader will go down to like fourth or third grade. Right. right. And right. so I was living. You brought your down. You're welcome. Yeah, I was I was living vicariously <laughs> through your youth. So you guys are like doing all your lunges and all this stuff on the side of the road, waiting for the cyclist. I'm like, man, man <laughs> that was how fun. nice is it to be young again? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, and that was fun. Like I think that energy, exactly what you said. Like that energy was so great to have because it is a long period of time where you're on the road, and so you do gotta stay sane somehow. And so like our little push up competitions or squatting or just like spraying each other with water balls and whatnot like it's just it, it was fun to 
it was fun to just have it, you know, to just kind of have this big kid kind of playful mental, playful demeanor yeah. all throughout yeah. while also knowing like when to hammer and, and to, you know, when we needed to, to really support our riders in, in terms of like motivating and not goofing off as much. But like, we, I think we had a perfect balance of, uh, of great energy, um, enthusiasm, drive, like determination, and then just like, um, and, and then just gratitude all throughout. Yeah. Thanks. Many thanks to you on, on spearheading yeah. a lot of that. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think the thing that people give me the nod to was those Facebook live sessions, which really just kind of came in a moment because I saw like something going on that I wanted to share with the audience. And then it really built on to, and that was a lot of fun. And it may have even learned to me kind of hosting this podcast, kind of getting like, oh, okay, cool. I can, I can talk a little bit. I never really looked at myself yeah. in that way. I mean, as a speaker, yes, it's usually prepared topics and all those other things, but that was very free flowing and, and whatnot. And that's kind of how I'm mm -hmm. kind of addressing the podcast as well as yeah. not a whole lot of structure and letting the stories kind of evolve there. Um, so, you know, after the race, you know, what was that like for you? And then, I mean, did you go right home and, and someone like you, you're, you're still working on your master's degree currently. Is that right? So actually, yes. Yeah, so I, I know I, I finished that in 2019. Oh. So I've, so it's been a couple of years yeah. now. Yeah, no. So it's, and, and that's totally fine. So yeah, I, I, um, I got my master's at the university of Utah. So I was, I've been in Utah for. Uh, I was there for four years and then I just moved out to San Diego where I'm at currently. Um, and so got, it, it was fun. I actually, after that trip, I, since we ended up in Annapolis, I got to go home for a couple of days um, to my parents' farm in Virginia. Oh, that's right. You grew up in Virginia. Yep. Grew up there. So, you know, and I'm just really grateful for that time because um, after a trip like that, like you, it, it, it's, it's almost like when you go camping, you're off the grid. Like we weren't off the grid. I still had like, cell service and was posting Instagram stories because I wanted to document oh, the, the same responsibilities. But... And that was one of the things I reflected yes. on was <laughs> being on a vacation with a fire hose. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. But it, but it was one of those things where I just felt like, uh, like when, when the world just boils down to a, like a mission and how you can, how are you going to get the team to, to complete that mission all together. Like everything else just kind of goes away. Like, you don't worry about checking your email, like, all the petty things of like, you know, um, that, that can add up, but take a lot of your time and attention throughout the day. And so I just felt so present during that trip. Um, so going home and like being ever more present with my family and all like our time on the farm. And just like, when I go home, it's the best time for me to be present because I'm just, you know, we do a lot of farm work cause we have a lot of land out there or, uh, you know, time with animals or um, like we're, we're just big homebodies <laughs> when we're on my farm and my dad's a saddle maker. And so he's, we've got horses and he's, you know, working with his hands all the time. And it's just, um, so, so it's just really grounding to like be home. But I felt like the, that trip, that whole experience was so grounding in and of itself um, because it really just all the, all the things in life that just are loud and noisy and, but aren't really contributing a whole lot to, you know, just your overall quality of life, that all those things kind of dropped away. And it was just like the people in front of you are the most important at that time, you know, and, and the, the common goal of getting from point A to point B, and then just soaking in as many memories and experiences as possible. Like, it's hard to go back to, to your regular flow of life after it that. Is. Um, so I'm glad I had like a gradual transition where I like got some time at home. And then, um, and, and then made my way back to Utah. But that was, it was special to just to be able to soak in all that and have that time as a group. Once we got to the hotel like the next morning, doing those exercises led by Monty of like reflecting on the trip and attributes that we appreciate about each of the, each of the individuals on our team and the role they played. I really like that because it's, it's like when you go watch a movie and then you just see it and you're like, cool, that was, that was cool. And then you just, and then you just go home. It's like, I love the discussion about it. It's like, what were the deeper, like what, what were the deeper moments or meaning, meaning behind different scenes or parts of that story that you can now carry with you or apply or reflect on. Yeah. So I just appreciate, like, there's just so much about that trip that stays with me. Well, I love that comment about you, like not just being grounded, but the fact that it allowed you to appreciate being in the present moment, not having to worry about the long-term outcome or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's such a powerful place to be able to come and, and exist in when you can. Um, you know, 
do you find that helps you in competition? Do you use that kind of mindsetting strategy when you're doing competition? Absolutely. Absolutely. What, especially in competition, like visualization is my, is my go-to. And so it's like, you know, not worrying about the things out beyond my control. So it's like, okay, what do I have here and now to work with? Um, what is the objective? How am I going to, you know, what are the steps that I can take to execute that in a, in a, you know, as flawlessly as possible. And I think, you know, a lot of people, or maybe it's just the approach of some people, like they like to get in other people's heads or like, or they let their competitors kind of seep their way into their mind or their thoughts. And so it's like, instead of worrying about my game, it's like, I'm focused on so-and-so and and like getting nervous about that, that they're competing. And, And so I've, I've dropped, I've, I've dropped that kind of, and I don't think I ever took that, um, approach with like my competition prep but I for sure have completely stopped worrying about any of that just because it's 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 just like worrying about stuff that's beyond your control it's not contributing anyway and it's only just taking away your focus yeah and I, I I won't say I learned it early in the SEAL teams but early in my career um if I were and what happened was is I was doing some mindfulness training and I looked back on like my major successes in competition. Operations is one thing. Cause like you got, you have no choice. You've got to live in the moment during an operation, mm-hmm. but during training and competition within the SEAL teams, people that are listening that, that pay attention to it, everything we do in the SEAL teams is a competition. You know, if we're cleaning up brass on the range at the end of the shooting day, it's a competition who can get the most brass, right? Like it's all the shooting drills. But when I would reflect back on those events that I just crushed, there was this aspect of like, I didn't know how I did it. And, you know, I was going through the mindfulness stuff. I recognized that what it was is I was absolutely focused in the moment and I was Mm -hmm. applying all those learned skills and my self-confidence was just executing those skills, not thinking about how I was executing it. And so as I became aware of that, I could start layering that in on purpose with intention. And I brought that into cycling and all the other events I've done since I've left the military and I'm not always great at it, but I know that those, those moments where I'm like, ah, it's when I wasn't thinking and I was just in the flow because I had that vision of my desired outcome. And man, I just love that. I just love that. And the confidence part that you mentioned is so key and it's, and it's, it's pretty hard. You know, that, that can be a challenging area for a lot of athletes. And I'm, I don't know if you've, you, you struggle with that. I'm assuming oh, you did. Oh, yeah. So many people, so many athletes are high performers, whether that's, you know, military athletics or just, you know, even in the regular job environment, like you, that, that comes, it's a direct translation or a direct outcome of your practice, your training. Um, and so like, I think that's why training confidence in just your day to day, or or maybe maybe it's like practicing that flawless execution, or knowing like okay, what's your what's the intent behind you know this training exercise that I'm doing today? Um, I think that really allows you to to bring that confidence when it comes you know when it comes to game time or or competition time or just hey mission time. Like I I really think that that's a big portion of uh, of, of that flawless execution. So like, that's, I think that's why, I mean, that's something I've, I've constantly been working on. Um, but it's like, just like training mindset, right? Like you're, if you do, you know, let's just in my, just because this is most applicable to me, like if I'm, I've got a certain workout for the day, like I'm going to attack that workout or that training with the intent that it was designed for, which my coach or my husband, I should say, uh, my husband slash coach, designs them in a certain way like I want to know okay like what's the what's the intent of this workout like what where, what should I be focusing on and then once I have that focus like I'm thinking about that the whole time and um you know and 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 then that mind the mindset that I'm adopting within that is now like something I can apply on competition day but it's if you don't train that mindset along with it then you can't expect to be able to implement that when it matters. Yeah. And I just want to highlight that comment you made about what was the intent of the workout or that exercise. Um, because I had that conversation with one of our trainers in the SEAL teams, again, late in my career. I mean, I was the, I probably operations master chief at team two at the time. And it was like the science behind our physical training is like top of the line these days. And it was like, Hey, here's your active workout. Like the, here's the component that we're working on today. It might be a power movement. And then here's your active recovery. 
But if that wasn't briefed, what is somebody like Bob doing? I'm putting out 100% on every single one of those apps, you know, things. Then I'm like, I'm like, like Dallas, what the hell's the point of this workout? Like I'm completely thrashed. Right. And like I had pulled him aside. I said, Hey, I really, if, if it's, if I'm having a question about what your intent is with this sort of how you've broken up these circuits or what have you, I know that the rest of the people do. So if, can you cover that? And I'm telling you, once he started covering like, Hey, here's your active recovery. What I want you to do is get your heart rate down and focus on the flexibility and just getting your posture moved and getting everything reset. So when you can go attack those hard efforts again, you're fully charged and ready to go. And man, that was like a click in my head of like, man, I've got to put that approach into everything that I'm doing with those intents and mapping those things out. Yeah, because you can't, you, you cannot. And that's something that like I had to learn kind of the hard way, but I used to think like, oh, if I can go a hundred percent as often as possible, which really is not, you know, it really ends up being like 85% as you know, because you just can't hold that for, for six or seven days out of the week. Like you need to have you need to have certain other intentions behind your workout. So yeah, if it's an active recovery day, yeah, you're not, you're not trying to blow through these movements or, or take 40 minutes and get your heart rate as high as possible. And so, um, you know, I, I, I work with a lot of athletes on their nutrition, but like a lot of that is knowing, you know, being tuned into their training regimens. And so I'm like, okay, well, and, and so sometimes it's challenging because I'm like, okay, well, you know, what's, tell me a little bit about your training throughout the day. And if they're just trying to go hard a hundred percent of the time, it's like, it's, it's a, it's, it's a lost cause because you know, it's, it's not, they're not getting, they, they're not getting anything out of it except just fatiguing themselves, like being utterly wasted by, you know, the end of the week. And then yeah, they're like overtaxing their endocrine system. I have that right. Like the, the, the yeah. cortisol levels, all those other things are getting elevated. So that means all of their other training is being, you know, you know, depleted. And I used to do the same. And I used to do the do the same thing until I re, until uh, you know until I realized, wow, if I can have a couple really in, like me, you know a handful, just a just a couple really intense sessions throughout the week, where I know, hey, this is my chance to empty the tank and and finish that workout flat on my back. And then there's other you know types of workouts throughout the week where you know it's more about breath control or like positioning or movement, like good move quality movement at a higher heart rate perhaps but you know but still trying to maintain form or posture or whatnot like that is when i know that intention behind it it's like you know that that gives me so much more direction and then you know obviously that translates that translates it all comes together it's like i know how to i i can empty the tank but i also can keep good positioning most of the time and like my form it doesn't break down as quickly and so there's all these different pieces to the puzzle it's not always just training like how hard can you go yeah. as free and then as all possible. leads into the confidence what we just talked about and then you can be poised yeah. under crisis during a competition or in the battlefield yes. or whatever the last thing you want to be doing at the start line is doubting yourself right like having all this self-doubt cloud your mind it's like you want to feel like I'm confident because I know I'm capable of doing this because I have practiced this a million times. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, but, but it's, my, it's, my, mind, it's all my mindset in the races is I want to crush souls, <laughs> but I'm not crushing them until the final burst, you know, for, yeah. for bike racing is very strategic and how you use, you have to monitor and measure your efforts because you don't want to be the one working. The whole thing's about reserving your energy until you actually need to use it. And, I would just love so showing up to the start line being like, I am going to crush some souls today. Not now. <laughs> and then I just basically was absorbing it, absorbing it, absorbing it. And then, yeah. then you can start paying attention because now I'm aware, you know, that confidence level is high and now I'm aware mm -hmm. to be able to pick up all the nuances that I'm seeing in the other riders. I'm trying to probe into their weaknesses or see when they're starting to get fatigued and know that when the next attack goes down, Oh, now's my time to pounce, right. you know? those long races like that like you said like there's the strategy can be you know there's strategy involved and it's and it's uh it's knowing like when to hold back when to push forward and um so i mean i'm not i'm i'm not experienced in bike racing but i can respect that uh, that aspect of so of so how did young corinna find her way into this competition field i mean you walk us back as far as you think is necessary to kind of like what was your driver what kind well, how did you find your way into this from a young farm girl in virginia uh, yeah man it, it is a fun it's a fun evolution and i and it's always it's always i always enjoy going back in the time thinking about all the things that led me to um 
the the journey that I'm on now and the passions that I have now. And I and I think two things um really kind of spearheaded that. Maybe three, but like they're all related. I would say family is one of them. So like I'm the youngest of uh, I have three brothers. Oh, so there's four kids. And we're all four of us are within three years, like from from oldest to youngest. So I have a twin brother. I have one who's we're almost Irish twins. He's like just over a year older than me and then one who's three years older than me. So we're just like packs, like sardines <laughs> and bless my parents' hearts. But um, we grew up on this beautiful horse farm in Virginia and um, and we just when I mean, we had a hundred acres of plant. It was like a, it was your dream childhood of just being outdoors. My um, dad was a competitive equestrian um, rider and Olympian and, and then, you know, turned saddle maker and kind of crafting, you know, becoming, becoming an inventor really with his saddle business of, you know, how to improve, um, the performance of the horse, um, through, you know, through his saddle technology. And so, um, he worked, our barn was like 200 yards from our house, um, on our property. And he had, you know, half of the barn was his workshop where he's got, you know, 10 employees or so. And um, the other half is for our horses. And we were just, you know, regardless of whether my mom was home or not, like we, my dad was always home. So we just explored the heck out of that, the woods and the, you know, down by the creeks and the ponds and we're fishing and exploring. So I, that just kind of like, there was a love of the outdoors and adventure from a very young age. And then of course, tapped into um, trying to keep up with three older brothers um, was no easy task because they're all just studs. Are they all beasts like you? They, 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 I try to emulate them all the time. They are, they are, uh, they are gifted in so many ways, but don't tell them I said that. (laughs) But yes. So, so that was just a really fun childhood. And I just remember we, we were all very active and, you know, played soccer from a really young age. And my mom, it's like, I don't really want to drive to four different soccer practices. So I'm just going to put them all on the same team. And that ended up being all boys teams. And, but I would just be the the one girl and it was nothing new to me because I was always the only girl, you know, in, in the household or other than my mom. And so, um, so that just kind of started this trend of just me being on all boys soccer teams and growing up and trying to play as aggressive as possible so that I could, you know, hang with everyone. And, my brother's doing a great job of, of helping me along as well. And so then it got into high school of just being interested in all types of sports, cross country, lacrosse, basketball. And um, yeah, gosh. And so we started this outdoor, um, my, my brother wanted to be in the military since he was in middle school. And so we joined this um, kind of military training, outdoor training boot camp um, called SEAL Team Physical Training, led by former Navy SEAL John McGuire out of Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. But uh, he, had, he had all these different outdoor boot camps every morning from like 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. And so um, my brother started off my just my brother was my stepmom was doing it. And then my bro- she got my brother to do it. And then I started doing it. And so we would just do that before school every morning as part of our conditioning. So there's not that many high schoolers that are just up at like 5 a.m., to do a, a, a workout outdoors with a former Navy SEAL and then, you know, going to classes and sports practice later in the day. But that was like my, my true introduction to fitness and leadership and, um, you know, it, that's outside of kind of the sports team. So it's outside of like, okay, well, you know, the end goal is to get the bus, this ball in this net. It was like so much more than that. And it was, um, you know, we we're working out with, everyone from our age to middle-aged adults or older. I think one of the oldest ladies there, like it wasn't a military prep program or anything. Right. So I think one of the oldest ladies was like in her sixties and just crushing it. lots of running and calisthenics and pull-ups and back to last. So like everyone's getting a workout regardless of your um, age or ability or skill level. And so that was, that got me into kind of thinking about fitness and nutrition and having this passion for, the like you know how they apply to one another um and then when i went to virginia tech they had a huge nutrition and exercise program and so um went to virginia tech got my got my degree in nutrition food and exercise 
and played club lacrosse for my first two years. And then I was just like itching to do something more. Like I just wanted, I was, I'm like always been someone who just enjoys doing a little bit of everything. And so I um, joined the triathlon team and I had only just a running background. I had I was just getting into cycling a little bit, never swam, you know, I didn't know how to freestyle or do any like, any like specific stroke um but the triathlon team was like very welcoming they're like you know what well you know we welcome anyone regardless of your ability and so that was really great and um just kind of enjoyed enjoyed learning a, like a totally new couple of totally new sports so like sort of the road biking and um and swimming came into play and then when i was home during the summers between um between college I would work out with SEAL Team Physical Training um, program just to, you know, just to stay in good shape throughout the summer. And it was a friend of mine through that program who texted me the night before. It was like a Friday night and I wasn't doing anything. And she was like, hey, I'm supposed to do this race tomorrow. It's like an obstacle course race. And um, and I sprained my ankle and I just wanted to know if you wanted my entry. Like, I know it's last minute. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh. um, really? Like, where is it? She's like, well, it's kind of in close to West Virginia. I don't know. It's like three hours away, or like maybe it was two hours away. I was like, you know what? I don't have anything going on this weekend. I'll like, I'll do it. So I went by myself. I think I told my mom the night before. I think I woke up at like three a.m. to make this drive, like in the dark, and uh, didn't know a single soul. I just wore my trashiest shoes, like like just road running shoes because I didn't want to get anything, my good ones, muddy. So I was just like, so minimal traction, you know, all that good stuff. And I am, and I, it was this amazing battle frog race, like I told you about initially. And I think it was like a 10 mile um, obstacle course race. And, and I had an absolute blast the entire time. It was just like running and jumping over things and carrying heavy objects and all these new obstacles I'd never, I'd never really done before. Um, but I felt, you know, I'd been prepared by my background and just so many different types of movement yeah. um, that I like, you know, it wasn't second guessing. It was like, I had that confidence of like, well, I'm, I'm able bodied, right. I've, I've put myself through all these different types of of um challenges physically and and so what's what's one more to add to it and so that was amazing i ended up winning for the women um at that race and i got a thousand dollars no i won the i won the whole thing for the women. <laughs> what year was this this was 2014 wow this was 2014. So I had just been doing, like, like I said, my triathlon training had, like, we had, we had great workouts and, um, the SEAL team physical training group was amazing with, um, you know, just being like, I just, it was just building up my running and my strength. And so did this race and, and it was so cool. Like I said, like they had, they had some good prize money. Like I'd never won a thousand dollars before. I felt like that was, uh, I mean, they, uh, <laughs> they were definitely making a, a splash in the obstacle course racing scene yeah by i mean that's a lot of i mean I'm not, i mean you're pro now yeah. so hopefully the payouts are more but you know i'm like oh. some of them aren't like yeah some of the some of the like, like regular spartan races they're not paying out a thousand to their like, like, some of their bigger yeah. races they are but yeah they were de battlefront was definitely making trying to make a big splash by coming into the coming into the um ocr world in 2014 with like big payouts they wanted to get you know a lot of athletes yeah for, but anyway, that was amazing. For a racer you know as a like a cat four racer i might have won a you know or podiumed a few races you were lucky to get your entrance you know fee covered <laughs> right <laughs> yeah so that's really great right so i got a free entry i think i got a free entry because of my friend and then right. it was definitely nice worth fan. the drive and then you had the, you had this itch now to scratch and so oh yeah but then after that i was like that was so much fun and i got i got paid to do that i was like well that well not got paid yeah. like i won some money from it. i was like that was pretty cool um but actually i will fast like i will i will rewind to a year prior um the summer before i'd done my first spartan race and i just did it with a group um and it was just for fun and it was in in, in wintergreen at wintergreen resort okay. in virginia and i think i started off running with my group that that seal team group and then i was like well, everyone's just walking like there's these giant hills uh, cause we're at a ski resort, but I was like, I feel like running these. And so I, I, I kind of 
left them a little bit. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go see how fast I can run this. And then when I just casually plugged in my bid number at the end, just to kind of see how you fared, because the heat time was in the middle of the day. And it said I came in first or second out of like a couple thousand um, people. Over. And I was like, wait, really? Like, really? And then someone, I think someone was near me and was like, you should have run elite. And I was like, what do you mean? Like there's categories and they're like, yeah, like there, you should, you know, you can compete in these things. And so I did a plank contest in the festival area to win an entry, a free entry to net to like another Spartan race. Um, and so I, I, I got the plank contest. And so I got a free entry and they're like, you got to just write down what race you want to apply to. And I was like, Oh, next year in 2014, when they come back to Virginia, so again, fast forward, then I did that battle frog race and then it was that winter green race coming up. And I was like, I got to do that. And I'm going to race it. And I think I came in second at that race. So I was like, wow, like, I, I think I'm pretty good at this. Like, I've got the strength. I've got the, the skill for some of these obstacles and my running seems to be pretty, pretty good. And so I just kept bouncing around that summer. I probably did four, I think I did four Spartan races that summer and made the podium and on on all of those ones so I was really excited and then the Spartan World Championship came up that September and I was it was my senior year of college um still on the tri team but this had this new (laughs) infatuation with this this sport of obstacle course racing and so um and all my triathlon teammates were like yeah you got to pursue this OCR stuff like you're doing great in it um but did so I flew out to Killington Vermont which is where the 2014 Spartan World Championship was and that's a that ended up being, it's supposed to be a beast distance, which is like 13 miles in Spartan race terms. Um, but it ended up being 15 miles. Um, and it was just up and down like the ski resort in Killington. So you're just covering so much, uh, so much Hard elevation, race. so much ground. I mean, and it was the hardest race I had ever done. Um, four hours and 22 minutes later, like it was a, it was a very long race. Um, I, my goal was to finish top 10, especially as like my, my first Spartan world championship. And I found myself in first place throughout most of the race. And I was like, I can't believe this is happening. Like, am I really like, am I really in first right now? And, um, ironically, my nutrition absolutely sucks. I was sucks just going it. to jump in and be like, okay, <laughs> four hour race, kind of first time four going hours. that distance. And I mean, you've got the degree. Got, but degree well, in practice. I wasn't quite wrapped up at that point. <laughs> which is to the left. Appropriate. Yeah, we're 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 a, a, a just about a year short of um of having the degree. But my my it was I'm embarrassed looking back, and I probably it's probably the best had, lesson you've learned. I I would bet you look back on is probably the best lesson oh, you can yeah. learn. I mean, less. I probably had less than 300 calories that entire race. <laughs> yeah, it was terrible. I I think I just got. I, you know, I I think I got excited, nervous. I, maybe I had 400. Like it was, it was bad though. It was really bad. I, I did, totally did you have a like fuel it. plan or you just sort of like, oh, no. no, oh no. No, 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 Bob. I don't know what I was thinking. I mean, I, I, I had a camelback and I had some, I had plenty of goos and stuff with me. I think I was so shocked of how, like my place. And it was like one of those things where, you know, you definitely, this was my first year of like doing any types of, all any of these kinds of races so like even though you know I was learning so much about nutrition still like the sports nutrition side of things or the application of it in sport was still fairly just to give young me a little bit of of uh of leeway I think like that that aspect I was good with fueling myself throughout the day but it just wasn't um it wasn't really sports oriented at that point in time and so uh, that was a big mistake um and I just like you know found myself neck and neck with this with the second place girl at the time and we had this last like the last two miles or last mile and a half was like this gauntlet of obstacles and I was so weak at that time like I remember being a foot from the bell of the rope climb and I was just holding on they have it on like on video because it's um they televise it and I was just shaking and I could not for the life of me I think my I think my um, lock foot lock method wasn't probably ideal at that time either, but I could not make that last foot. And so I dropped from the top of the rope climb, had to do 30 burpees, which is the penalty. And Claude Gabou, she's a, um, she's a, um, a Canadian. She ended up beating me by like a minute and a half. So like, or two minutes. So it was like, 
it was like one set of burpees between me and potentially taking that the win and you know i just know like ah the fueling that completely could have been a game changer yeah and that feeling of a bonk and knock on wood i've never experienced it during a competition but like when an athlete hits that wall it's almost otherworldly feeling because like oftentimes you you can still monitor your heart rate but or, or you 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 feel like you can control your input and output, but it just doesn't work the way that your brain is telling you yeah. to work. Like, oh, pick up the pace. You can't pick up the pace. You know, it's, right. it's yeah, you're, you're, yeah, it's like this is all I've got at the time. I mean, luckily, I think some people really cramped hard during that race. And I would, every time I felt like a little cramp coming on, I'd be like, okay, I'm taking like some electrolyte tabs or some salt tabs. Um, so, you know, I did do that. But I, but I think I was so surprised. It was like a combination of like, running on straight adrenaline just the fact that i was doing this race in the first place it was we had this freezing cold swim that we had to do um and you know it's october it's like end of september in vermont so it's very cold and you're not wearing you know you're you're just in your running clothes and then and then having like being in a position that i didn't believe i was gonna be in um and then just trying to like not to just being the rabbit and not having anyone catch me. I think it was all those things where I was just like, yeah, I'm not going to fuel. Like I'm not, or I'm not like, it wasn't on my mind. And and then, you know, so there's so many factors to that bonking and nutrition as well as your mentality. Right. So like, I mean, I can't say that this is what happened to you, but I know that I've found myself in similar environments where I was a little surprised at my outcome. Like, well, I, I didn't mm-hmm. think I was going to be up front. And and your adrenaline, right? If your body starts dumping adrenaline because of the, you're sort of like, I can't believe I'm here, you're even burning more energy oh, yeah. than you had planned on. And that, like, that's like, you always got to try and temper that stuff down. So it. Oh yeah, this was this was. There's so much I've learned since then. So, um, so it's it's fun. <laughs> it's fun to look back on that and, um, you know, and, and kind of use it as a learning experience. And we all start somewhere, you know. I think that was you know, that was definitely younger Corinna who had yet to really dive into that application of like sports nutrition, which is what I got my degree, my master's yeah. degree in at Utah. So like had, had a lot of racing experience since then. After that, I joined um, my first pro team with that battle frog um, company um, that winter um, of my senior year of college and just raced for them for the next two years and was traveling all over and had had lots of experience from there to like with with fueling and different strategies and kind of nailing that down yeah and how complicated is it for a professional ocr racer obstacle course racer right to like Mm -hmm. plan out and train for the year right i i suspect you know they happen in some sort of you know regular basis but like are you training for one event and then the others are sort of workups? You know, that's, that's how a lot of cycle racing goes. It's like, Hey, here's the premier event. Here's the, here's my goal is to win this. And I'm going to compete in these half a dozen or dozen or so other events to kind of get my fitness back and to work on my skills and everything else. But I don't. That is an ideal scenario is, you know, I think from, I think in 2016, so my first year, my first full year being signed, because I signed in 2015 and then 2016 was, um, Oh, sorry. My first year being signed. So 2015, um, I think I raced 27 races from March to November. It was absurd. That's that's it, more than once a week. It was. Is, is right. That, that or, or it is once a week. It's it's close. Yeah. It, well, it was every I know for a fact that sometimes there were some months where I was doing three races in a month. Um but it was at least twice, twice a month. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, then you're traveling all over. Like it was absurd. I think it was absolutely absurd. I think I was so excited about racing. I just wanted to race them all. And then, you know, and that was like yeah. the battle frog racing circuit. And then the Spartan race had their own, you know, you had their own criteria for how many races you had to do for a certain series and, and all these things. So by the time we racked them all up, it was, um, and then there's this independent race series that putting on different world, world championships. And so, yeah, by the time you add them all up, it's like, holy cow, you're racing all the time. And I didn't at that time, it was like, yes, of course I want to do well by the time world championships came around. But when I look back, even just my programming, um, was, 
you know, you, you do need to have your A races. You need to have a couple of those races where you're like, okay, I'm going to peak by this time. And then you need to have, you know, your B and C races where you just kind of treat them as your training, um, training races. And, you know, if you do well, great, but it's not going to, you're not going to have a full taper build up to that race. And then, you know, and then the whole recovery after it's like, you kind of have to go through it, you know, maybe, maybe race it a little bit more fatigued and then, you know, um, you know, and, and recover sufficiently from it. But like, it's can't be your, you can't be catering to every single race as if it's like the big race or else you're going to miss out on those you know, the, the important training aspects of just a, a training block in general. Yeah. And so I've asked you to kind of describe a little bit what the culture is like, um, because it's, I mean, the, at the professional level for this type of race, or is there sort of like a demographic of people like, oh, they have this type of background and now they're pivoting to a new sport or are they coming from all over the place? And then like, what's the camaraderie and the competitors like? I mean, are there a lot of nemesis out there or like, what what's it like? You know, it has, and it has evolved so much. I am really grateful that I got into the space when I did, because, um, it was still kind of in its nascency a little bit. Like I think in 2010 was when things, when, when Spartan and Tough Mudder really kind of kicked off and became really popular. Um, and so I came in at 2014 and I was one of the youngest, I was probably the youngest at the time, um, female athlete, at least on the female side. And a lot of the competitors that I was up against um, were like, you know, late twenties or early thirties and like young moms or like had, you know, other professions going on, you know, had, had full-time jobs and careers. Um, so that was kind of fun and humbling to, to get my ass whooped by, <laughs> by like a gal with three kids and just being like being super mom and, and me being, you know, just, fresh out of college as a 21 year old. But, um, I think the cool thing is like initially, and I think you still see it is that there's a lot of individuals that come from all different sort like types of backgrounds, obviously like you're, um, as Spartan gets more streamlined with their races and their obstacles. So like, you know, they, they're, they're streamlining their distances and, you know, having very specific obstacles and like, you know, Spartan's not known for like necessarily having the, the most creative obstacles. Like they're, they, you, you know what to expect when you go up to it when you go to a Spartan race like you're gonna have these set of obstacles and they're not going to be the most challenging um, but over the course of a race like you're you know it, it's going to be very taxing because you're still trying to get from the start to the finish line as fast as possible but I will say it, it does cater to more of like the fast like the faster runner like um, so for me it was always you know I, I kind of came from this background of just all these different types of sports um and and athletics but I wasn't like the runner girl you know I wasn't like the one who was the d the d1 track and field or cross country runner which you see you see some of that now where a lot of your best performers are individuals who did some sort of aerobic sport um in in college or in high school and and not always though but so that's the kind of the cool part is like you get these individuals who have this perfect amount of like strength to running or endurance like ratio. And I think that's what I love about the sport in general is that it, it really does like no two athletes are the same when you're comparing, you know, if you compare first like the podium, like every single one on that podium is, has a completely different kind of backstory in sport. Um, and it's exciting style, because like, because you can't it's sizing up your competitors unless you've competed with them previously is like, you know, like the cover of the book doesn't necessarily meet like how they're going to you know perform on the course. Right. Like absolutely. there's Lindsay Webster, who's like probably the number one um, female obstacle horse racer in the world right now. You know, she has, she has a background in like cross country skiing and figure skating and then, you know, and then, but, but she did run cross country in, in college, but, you know, it was kind of, um, but, but like all throughout her childhood and, and adolescence, like it was, you know, the cross country skiing and, um, and kind of winter sports. And then it got into mountain biking. And then like Claude Gadbu, who was the one who beat me at the 2014 Spartan World Championship, she is a former um, Olympic biathlete. So she does all this cross country skiing and shooting. And so, but like, it's cool to see how certain sports translate into, you know, like that aerobic fitness that you need for 
um, you know, for, for obstacle course racing, especially when it comes to like hilly mountainous courses, which there's plenty of those in, in with, with Spartan races and whatnot. But then I love, I just love the addition of the strength training in there because I think that everyone should implement or have some sort of strength training regimen in there. And so that's standard in each of those courses now in the Spartan races specifically, there's some aspect of strength. Yeah. Like, you know, there's, there's a sandbag carrier or bucket carry, or, you know, you, you need to have a certain amount of upper body or, and or grip strength to like to traverse across, you know, monkey bars or up or there's upper body, you know, there's Herculean hoists or like things that even just getting up over a high wall, you know, like you're, you you can't you're if you find some joe schmo off the street like majority of them probably can't get over you know those obstacles unless they have some sort of strength training so so. some of what you're covering when i was thinking of like the cover doesn't meet the outcome that you would expect is we used to have these folks in the seal teams and usually i I can tell you confidently like each of my phases in the teams there was at least one person attached to the team not per platoon but in the entire team so a seal team's got 150 ish operators there was always one person that we would classify as the iron marshmallow (laughs) have you heard that term before no i haven't but i like it it, right it's the guy completely unassuming a little bit of fat (laughs) <laughs> probably been that way his whole life right a little bit larger large big boned maybe or something like that yeah, yeah. And, and then the new guy shows up to the team and the guy's like you know everybody's like hey who do you think's gonna win this event i'll be like oh toast over there he's gonna crush it and they'd like look at toast and be like get the hell out of here and then he <laughs> rushes everybody to iron marshmallow this unassuming dude who's like a schism dude you know and, and so i i've watched some of the um obstacle course events and i've seen some iron marshmallows out there competing and just dusting <laughs> folks and i just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's great because like I really think I mean, when you think about I, I really think that a lot of the individuals at the top of the sport in obstacle course racing just do a great job of def- I think there's there's so many different body types and I know especially on the female side like it's it's comforting to see that there's not just one um, a specific mold that sure. you have to be to you know to do well in a sport so you have individuals from all different types of bodies body um types um but the cool thing is like muscle is still like is still highlighted like you you it's clear that these men and women are are strong and then they and they work on that and i think that that's really cool to see as like you know as a, you know for the younger um, and that's the natural you know, development that I've seen is like, you know, you talked about like the endurance athlete. So if somebody was a marathon runner, they have this very specific sort of ectomorphic build, you know, and then, oh, but that person's a triathlete, right? They've got the broader shoulders back, their biceps and legs are a little bit more developed from the cycling and from the swimming. Yeah. I mean, now when you talk about the, the OCR, the obstacle courses, you know, that's good tip, you know, the muscle is important and you're, so yeah. you have these high performing athletes that are still strong and capable of doing much more. I mean, you know, doing a 13 to 15 mile obstacle course. I mean, I can't, I was never an obstacle course fan. Just yeah. it's not a <laughs> spot in buds. It was like the one, like, I did not mind swimming. I had some issues with running, but I, you know, I was good at it um and diving all other stuff but man obstacle course day you know did at least once a week and it was just okay <laughs> and i had to run it five seconds faster than i did the previous week yeah. the time and so it was like okay here we go so it's like this incremental thing for me i was so bad at the o course that um and like towards the end of second phase C. <laughs> mccarthy who was like the antichrist of buds instructors was like Newman, I'm going to be behind you on this obstacle course. You better not let me pass you. Oh, my God. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it was my you know obstacle what? course. And then I had to it, I had a whole other third phase where I had to continue to make faster times each time. I- oh, my God. I know. That's the funny part. I, I think um, it's funny you say that because actually you know, being out here in San Diego and, and being friends with Mark, James, I mean, we are probably out on that, off, that O course every saturday like every saturday that he's available and that i'm around we're, so we're out there on the i love That's it crazy. i love it so much and it's so cool to just have it in my backyard <laughs> um but but i could see you know you're out there and you see a lot of the guys who are going through training and just kind of learning the ropes and um you know, and definitely have some guys where you just tell like that's the, not their cup yeah. of tea. But and the instructors, they had me pink because I was above average and everything else in buds. But the O course, I was like 
little bit below average. And so they knew yeah. it was like, in their mind, I was sandbagging it. In my mind, it's like, I just didn't like, you know, I, I was also a little bit of metering, you know, it's like the obstacle course was the one that could take out a lot of people from buds and like, injuries yeah. that you weren't going to recover from. And so it was like, Hey, and I, and I actually, when it came to some aspects of training, I'd say, I recognize that when we play sports, you know, playing soccer as a seal in a platoon would take out more seals than any other training thing. And it was, and so I looked at that and I'm like, okay, is this worth me giving it 100% when I could blow out my yeah. ankle or whatever else? And it's so anyway. No, that's a good point where the risk, risk reward kind of assessment. And, and um, that's what the instructors saw. They're like, Bob is sand, but Newman is sandbagging on this and we got to push him outside of his comfort zone. And they were successful at it. Oh, so yeah. right. That's funny. Well, I, I enjoy it. I'll run it. I'll run enough O courses. For you, Bob. To make well, if I you. make it out to Sand Dog while you're still out there, we'll have to do it with you and Mark. Perfect. Um, that'll be, be if I if I can still get up that thing with this claw. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say, like, just to your point with the obstacle course racing, or what the point I was making with, like, you know, just having the strength component, um, and that being a much bigger element than you know any other kind of running oriented um, event or competition out there. Um, is that now that they're now they're co- like it's cool because I have always been a more strength based like ever since I found CrossFit in uh, in college when I was doing my triathlon training I fell in love with it and it was like there was no debate whether that was going to continue being a part of my training regimen or not like I, I loved it so much I had so much fun with it that that was always going to be an element to my training for better or worse and honestly I will say it was worse probably in some scenarios just because um it just took a lot of my time and a focus like I had so much fun in doing CrossFit that you know slowly it started taking over my running training and um and and, and so I I find that like I'd be by far you know maybe the strongest or very proficient at the obstacles and all the strength based moves but when it came to actually just running speed and you know being able to move move through the course the fastest that was a struggle for me but now there's all these wonderful events that are just spurring up that are now catering to this hybrid Hybrid, right like there's a little bit of crossfit and some of the components of these other races yeah or like it's like okay there's a little bit of running but then there's a lot like a strength component and then there's um some obstacles or you know or some sort of combination of that and um and and that is you know that i wasn't searching for that necessarily but like i've always just been someone who's like i'm gonna do what i have fun with like at the end of the day fitness and nutrition are such a a part of just my the, my way of life that you know I'm going to I'm going to go after whatever it is that like is going to give me a challenge but and and bring me bring me joy so like that means swimming and mountain biking and crossfit and and running and like and that's it's just weird like you know who how many people are doing all those different things but now all of a sudden it's like oh there's an event that's kind of like that includes all of those things. And that's kind of like what the Spartan games, um, which I'm sure we'll get into at some point, but like that it was exactly like there's Spartan came up with this event that is now testing. It's like, it's like across the board, let's find the fittest athlete. And I would say, I mean, CrossFit kind of does like finding the fittest athlete out there in their terms, but this is more of like an endurance focus. It's, Finding I mean, I was able to watch a little bit, and we can pivot there now. I, I think um, it's like okay. that Spartan Games. From what I was able to observe from it, it is basically what you described. It is working on that top tier, no pun intended, athlete, the people who can do it all. And it was focused kind mm-hmm. of on a lot of the attributes that we look for as special operators, right? Like mm-hmm. you know, grit, drive, determination, your skill set, your strength, your endurance your mental acuity, being able to stay calm, cool, and collected with complex problems to solve. I mean, sh- tactical stuff, you know, you had weapons and wrestling, gra- grappling, or whatever, you know, whatever that component was, like it was all encompassed right. in there. And so, you know, what can you tell us about sort of the build up to that, the ask of, of how you got involved with it? And then what was the experience like? Yeah. And, and, and so just for listeners, like the Spartan games is, so they started this last year during COVID because all of the Spartan races had to just be shut down in 2020. So this was Spartan's way of, Hey, we're still going to have some sort of like 
cool uh, championship style or just like, you know, end of the year style event. And we're going to, it's going to be at Joe DeSena's farm in Vermont. We're going to invite 12 or 12 male athletes, 12 female athletes. We're going to take the top individuals from <clears throat> obstacle course racing, from triathlon or, you know, running. Um, so this was an invitational. This was invitation. Yeah. yeah. So this was, this was invitation. So last, this was last year with the 12 and 12 and they just kind of took like power lifters and crossfitters and, and obstacle course racers, triathletes, like all, all these different, like kind of, you know, your top end athletes who um, kind of represent all the different disciplines that they were testing. And then you pull them together. And now over the course of four days, you're going to have 10 events and we're going to just test you in, in, in strength and endurance and stamina and agility and all these different things. So we showed up last year knowing like, oh, there's going to be a little bit of, you know, like we kind of got little hints here and there about what the events were like. But other than that, we had no clue like what we were in store, what was in store for us. And um, they televised it. Like they had a whole production crew and ended up making four episodes, one for each day of the event. And so that's, that's, you know, that's under the Spartan Games on YouTube. But that was an incredible experience because exactly like you said, I mean, we had one day we'd have, um, you know, an open water swim and then we'd have a mountain bike, like a, a five hour mountain bike crit kind of thing where, you know, as many laps as you can in five hours. Then one day there we'd be wearing a weight vest up, a, up, a, up a mountain for a mile as fast as you can. And then, um, a six hour ultra run, like as many laps you can do in six hours. And then there was wrestling. And then there was a heavy stone lift where it's like, as you know, trying you know, the weights got increasingly heavier. There was um, Spartan has this event called the Deca Strong or Deca Heavy, um, which which is part of their Deca Fit circuit, which is like very gym based kind of um, barbell heavy lifting machine. You know, rower, skier, you know, heavy D balls. Um, so like it's just kind of like a total gym gym workout right there. So like we had all these different types of um, domains that we were tested in and then they would crown, you know, the, the winner male and female. And so last year I came in second place. Um, Lindsay Webster came in first. And um, so they invited back the podium from last year to do this year's one. And they cut it down from 12 to eight. So eight men, eight female, or sorry. Yeah. Eight men, eight women. And um, it, it was out in big bear, uh, so in my neck of the woods this past year, and it just happened about a month ago. So um, it was like mid-October. And uh, similar, like, so so now we're coming in, like, I knew this was going to happen this year. Like, I knew that they had announced that they were going to keep this Spartan Games awesome. event, and I was really hoping I'd be invited. I, I was wait, assuming I, I would watch it. It was so much fun, you know, but like going into this year, you know, I knew like, okay, well, I, they're probably not going to have it the exact same. Like I knew it was going to be the exact same, but I knew kind of the elements that they were testing. And I was like, but I, I didn't did know they when make it was going to be. a little bit like, Hey, it did. Oh, yeah, thing, yeah. and you know, it's going to be four days long, but you don't know what we're going to be throwing yeah. at you. That's awesome. Exactly. We got a, an athlete brief each evening that's and awesome. that's when they told that us. That's such a mind <laughs> game. That is such a mind game. Oh. And I loved that. I love that so much. And I think it's why I fell in love with obstacle course racing in the first place, because I loved that element of like, Hey, hopefully you prepared, you know, hopefully, hopefully you can deal with that type of just like, um, I don't even know what would you call it? Just like being adaptable, right? Like, I mean, it's being able to take on challenges as they come without like knowing exactly when to expect things. I'm all about that because that's life for you. Right. It's really the different, the reason I love that is because that's the test of an operator and you know what that term means to someone like me, right? Like, mm -hmm. like I used to tell people like, don't be a shooter, be an operator, an operator is somebody who can solve problems. They've got self-confidence, self-discipline, and they can really read the lay of the land and see what is expected yeah. of them to succeed. Um, and so like, from a sports analogy, like, I don't think there's a comparison to that. There's, there's right. no other like a tiered event like that where like you just show up and here's the envelope, you know, like yeah. you'll get it. Like what? Yeah. And I loved, and I, I just love that because we're all in the same playing field. It's like, not like any of the other athletes had a heads up too. So it's just like, okay, we're all waiting. And then, and then you kind of think on your feet, exactly. Like you said, you're problem solving. You're like, okay, what's going to be my strategy? What is, is, you know, like, what, um, 
what is this requiring of me and how do I prepare myself? How do I best prepare myself in this? You know, we usually would have a sleep, like, like, you know, we get announced the, the next day would be announced at like 8 PM. And so we'd have like that night of sleep to kind of, and the next morning to kind of prepare ourselves and then it was go time and I and I just love that like I, I I don't know why I love it so much I think I just I think I like relying on that part of like that critical thinking or yeah. um on your feet kind of just like go with it kind of attitude um and it really freaks some people out like I think there's a lot of there's a lot of individuals especially that first year last year when we had like no clue what was really going to be thrown at us um I some people did not do well with the with that's you know and i think it came from like a lack of confidence in their ability mm -hmm. to well, i was going to so you know what we call these in the seal teams we do them all the time we're not as often as we used to you know <laughs> since the war started and our training regiments got so truncated everything's so co compressed now but we call them monster mashes mm -hmm. and okay. that's what it is and sometimes the monster mash brief is the day before you know but it's not ever far out there you kind of be like hey expect it to be six hours long or whatever else like mm -hmm. And we would, we would have, you know, maybe a, a squad of people would develop some really complex problem. We'd have support, sometimes helicopters and boats dropping us off and other destinations or whatnot. Or sometimes there's something just really done on the base there. Um, mm -hmm. But what an interesting observation I had early in my career was you either want to go first or last. For some reason, and it, I think it's a mental game, and, and it's not for everybody. Some people in the middle can do really well. So I'm wondering if you saw any of this Come, and this is just my own opinion on why the people going first are an advantage because they don't know how bad it is. They're right. just charging and going to problem solve as best as they can. And the people who maybe start next are going to see the stuff ahead and be like, oh my God, that's horrible. And then that yeah. mental game defeats them, you know, because they're like, oh, you know, Bob's up there. He's super strong and he's struggling. And the next thing you know, and then it sort of like staggers around. And the last people that get to go, they get to kind of game and strategize a little bit. And a lot of times our monster mashes were team oriented, at least shooting pairs or sometimes a squad or a fire team. Um, so that last team has the advantage of really strategizing and kind of, you know, understanding like, hey, we're going to get our game, our game face on here. And yeah. go over it. Well, and I'll, and I'll, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, so I'm wondering if you saw any of that. I mean, I think some of them were mass starts, but I'm sure there was other evolutions where, you know, it had to be like, hey, you're, you're in the queue and you're going to go third out of the eighth group or whatever else. So, right. Well, and that's what I was going to say. Like, we didn't really, it, it, there was never this like, okay, who wants to go first? It was always like, okay, this is the first pair. And so I found myself either in the like toward the front or or you know the for the first very first day first event i was the last person to go and like you said you can kind of make the best right. you can make the best of that for sure by gaming it um but you know there it, it, it definitely comes with with pros and cons for sure all throughout but um yeah that I mean that was so i think year one was for sure just a much bigger element of surprise because we just had no uh, we had n no other years to go off of um, in terms like this was that was the first time they'd done put on an, an event like that. And so this past year we had a little bit we knew that like maybe six out of 10 or six out of the nine events they, they adjusted it to nine events this year, but would be similar or have similar components with and we had one total mystery event, which was like we got um which we like didn't know about until we said, Oh, and this is our mystery event today. And so we were like, okay, well, I wonder what it is. And then that's when they told us it was a tactical, it, it was a tactical event where, you know, we'd have heavy carries um, and shooting and, you know, we, we had the guys um, from the shooting range the night before give us like our, you know, gun safety hand, like, um, gun safety and handling um, demos and just had some time to just yeah. kind of get so, to the ARs that we were using. So we're recording this on November 18th. As Corinna said, they did this about a month or so ago and the episodes aren't going to start until sometime in January. And yes. I, we're not going to necessarily talk about results here, but if they happen, awesome. But I just want to give any spoiler alerts out there. There's no way I've given her my word. I'm not going to release this episode until after the final episode airs. Um, so can you talk us through you know, those events that you guys go, cause I'd love to yeah. drive some more traffic to the Spartan races and let that YouTube channel, you know, get some more traffic from our listeners as well. Absolutely. And I, I think I was telling you before we recorded with that, you know, the air force special warfare was the Spartan game sponsor. Oh, okay. um, this year. And so there was, so um, there was a, there was a, 
military component or tactical component to um, some of the events. Were there pararescue men there? There were, um, uh, what are they, TACP, TAC mm-hmm. control, yep. or, or TACPs. And um, we had a couple, we had we had two guys who were um, fairly high up. I'm, I'm embarrassing myself that I don't know what, there, there was an, one air traffic controller and then there was um, a, a gentleman, um, Master uh, Master Sergeant Ryland McNeely, and he's he's um, I think he just got a, a pretty great award um, this past year, and so and I'm doing a disservice by no, not remembering. I'm, I'll, that, I'll, my but, team, I'm sure my yeah. <laughs> team is is aware of of, of uh, yeah. McNeely, so cool. No, it was yeah. They were they. He was great. They were all so great, and it was cool to have have you know actual airmen there. Um, being a part of the event, whether it was like them judge um, serving as judges or kind of, I mean, for those guys, they actually walked us through their, um, you know, they, they, they did the demo round for our tactical, our final, like our mystery tactical event, which was the the heavy carries and shooting. So it was fun to get to see them in their element kind of um, execute for us. But day one was the Air Force PAST test, P-A-S-T test, a physical standardization um, ability p- physical ability and stamina test and so it was um you know the 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 standard push up sit up or pull up sit up push up um mile and a half run but then there were the two 25 meter underwaters and then a 500 meter swim and we were doing this in a lake so that's i'm assuming those are all in cool. usually in pools. Yeah. and so you know the visibility was zero it was the most it was the of all the four days of competition, it was the most miserable weather day. Like it was rainy and mist, misting and like windy, and the water temperature was like forty nine degrees. What the conditions? What are you talking about? We had wetsuits. We had wetsuits, but it was so cold. It was so cold, and I remember the boys went first, and if oh, first thing is like you know there's so there's six events right the push up pull up sit up mile run 20, 225 meter underwater 500 meters from if you did not meet the minimum standard so eight pull-ups um 40 push-ups 50 sit-ups the 10 20 under 10 20 in the mile and a half you had to complete two out of two you only got two chances two out of two underwater breath holds and the 500 meter swim in less than i think it's like 13 minutes or something something like that if you did not if you failed one of those you get a zero for the entire event oh, wow. for that entire event. Okay. So, and um, the point system, so like the, all like how well you do in all those six different and There's events, a point for each you, one. There was a point system for each one of those. Yep. And then they, and then you would, the, so the, whoever had the most and the second would, would then be delegated their points um, based off Spartan scoring for different events. So, so, and I, and I'm not going to give it completely away. Um, even though I know like this, this won't be, yeah. well, maybe I will, maybe I'll say a little bit. I won't, I won't tell the placement, but I will let you know that only four guys out of the eight. So 50% Pat, like got a score for that oh, event wow. and only three, and only three girls got a score for that event. So that was, that was tough in some way. Like I kind of liked the cutthroat. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right, like, right in the throat, hey, right out of the gate. You know, Look, kind of. Game like, on. Hey, you can't you know if you don't meet the standards then you don't meet the standards and they're kind of keeping the keeping it the same like it's the same way for their the airmen and women like if you don't you know if you fail one of those like you don't get a score for that for that pst or past so you um and but you have to finish it like they that was one of the things like you still have to complete all the element all the aspects of it um because we're trying to make, they're trying to make everyone better and like get better at the next time. So that was, so you can imagine if people didn't make the mile and a half run, they were like, wait, we still have to get in the water and it's freezing and do all this stuff. So that wasn't the most uh, popular. But what um, a great start. I mean, you're talking about looking into the fortitude of people's mindsets right out of the gate because for both the people that were successful and got a score for that event, you know, they've got to still keep their egos in check. And then those who yeah. got a zero, yeah. 
it, they yeah. got to keep their ego in check too, because that they can be self-defeating, you know, or looking at those other competitors like, oh my gosh, I mean, this is right out of the gate and I can't even do this part. How am I going to beat them in those other events? And, right. and yeah, it, it we'll too, like they don't let that stuff get into their head, you know? So I'm hoping, you know, I can't wait to watch. It's going to be really great. Oh, it'll be, it's, 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 it'll be very entertaining. Um, and you know, I, I think, I think that making that decision, like, Hey, you don't get any points for that. Like that was, it was definitely cutthroat, but like you said, I, I kind of, I kind of appreciated that the standard was the same as it was in the military. But I also, you know, on day one, if someone had, so the, the, the way the point system works was like 25 for first place, 18 for second, 15 for third, 12, 10, eight, and then zero and zero for the last two places. So if you can imagine like, someone having a 25 if you if you didn't complete that event and then the winner got 25 points that's really hard to make up like that person would have to come in the bottom two you know at one of those events even just to be on a, a similar, similar playing field, field yeah so i will say with the point system it was a little bit i could definitely see the angle of that being slightly unfair or unideal maybe not unfair but just like if you're trying to have eight individuals be in contention all the way to the last day for an event, and that's yeah, that the only one for somebody to podium. Yeah, podium that's the only place. event that had the six criteria that you know, and like, like it wasn't like most people were going to get zeros in other events. Okay, like so you're probably gonna. So, so I will say like that was probably a negative aspect uh, that 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 did kind of play into a little bit. So. Um, but yeah, but anyway, I, I, um, I really enjoyed that. All right. So that's an awesome roll up of that first event. And I think you're right that like, that's, that sort of sets a precedence that like, Hey, if you got a zero in there, it's going to be hard to come back. But again, that's competing, you know, and I love the fact that you're getting into that sort of champion's right. mindset of, uh, okay, well, I guess if I want to win this thing, I'm going to have to really up my game. And so you only did that. It was, right. I say only, I mean, that's, that's a great event, a great workout. When we did our seal PRT, that was the game changer for me is, you know, ours was a um, three mile run, a um, one mile swim. Yeah. One mile swim or 1200 meters. My God, I, can't believe I don't remember. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Pull ups, push ups and sit ups, much different numbers than, than what, what you had, yeah. had given. It was all a point system. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't until I was probably in the SEAL teams for like 10 years before one of my chiefs was like, man, that's a great workout. To me, it was like a pass or fail evolution. Like you had to like crush it and get the best, best numbers. And once I looked at it as like a fantastic workout, it was like totally changed the way I addressed doing our PRT and it was great. And then they ended up going back to the regular Navy PRT, which is like, frankly, a joke. It's, it, was it was embarrassing to the SEAL teams no. to like go to the Navy PRT for the scoring system. Um, but we used to have a great PRT. So that's a, that's a big drag of going like, full out outside your comfort zone swimming under the water for 25 meters pass fail all that stuff so you got adrenaline going there endurance race the cold you know all these uncertainties i will i will say i forgot so that was the second event of the day because the first one we had was in the morning and it was um it was like a deca fit event which is basically you know and, and it, which again that's not going to mean anything to anyone well, what is a deca fit event i've never Spartan heard that before it's Basically, I mean, it was like a, a giant monster match of like a of a of a CrossFit style workout. So you had like you were we were tactical um, five eleven tactical weight vest. We just sprint down like a hundred meters, come back, and then we had twenty burpees. We had you know five hundred meter um, skier. We had a sled. Oh yeah, we had really really heavy sled push on grass that was not had very had a lot of friction and so it was or maybe i guess i should say not a lot of friction um but anyway it was just moving so slowly it was probably like a four to five oh. minute sled push um for a lot. yeah it was very challenging i mean it ended up being that long for a lot of people just because the grass was so thick um we had like dead heavy deadlifts we had a, a, a assault bike calories we had this um i'm blanking on the name but you almost like do like a zercher carry with it it's like almost like a metal um like football tackle dummy looking thing and you had to carry it under like with bent elbows underneath the arms and um you know carry it and squat with it and stuff so it was just kind of like this it was definitely catered toward more of like the strength um like crossfit style athletes and so and and i think the average time was about um 10 10, 10 to 15 minutes 
Like it was definitely all it was out, like you yeah, know, all, all out, out heavy stuff. lift. So you're already fatigued. So that was in the morning, and then you know what I think? I think that day just felt so long because you know the, the waiting in between the anticipation, the knots in your stomach, and then like for that event. We had two people going at a time. It was like the girls and then the guys. It's a ton of waiting around. There's a ton of like, oh, you gotta get warmed up. You're not sure what order you're in. And then they call it the order. And I'm like, oh, I'm last. So I gotta like pull back down, get warm. And then I gotta warm back up again. And so it's just, you know, like just like competition. It, 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 uh, <laughs> there's just a lot of, of, of adrenaline and emotion that's, um, like the highs and lows of riding this roller coaster throughout the day. And so, but then, yeah. And then we had lunch. And then the afternoon was this, was the, PAST and um and it was just I think with the with the water temperature and everything like I just remember being absolutely zapped of just um, for those of you that'll be able to watch that. this um you won't be able to tell because Corinne is wearing a sweatshirt but she has probably like four percent body fat for a woman so <laughs> well, I don't know about you're, that but I late. was just all jacked over the entire yeah. <laughs> The entire drive home, I could not get warm. And I, until I got in the shower, I was just like, I, I just could finally decompress it. But it, I mean, you know this too. And like, just seeing all these guys out here training and, you know, in San Diego, it's like, when you're cold for so much a day. Like, it's just, it's so fatiguing and it's your so hips, energy your, your consuming. Your hip flexors it's, crunch and, up. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So I have I have a lot of respect for individuals who can bear the cold. So what? Long so you time. did those two evolutions, but you guys stayed like together, right? As as competitors. So what was that yeah. like? You know, breaking bread and doing all that stuff well, between, between oh, those I, events. So actually, so last year we all stayed together. It was like a girls' floor and a guys' floor, and we were all like in little cots, like literally sergeants, yes, right? Being in the military right against each other. Yeah. This year we got totally spoiled and we each and we had like cabins and there was only two of us per cabin so we had you know our room to ourselves we were able to um you know just kind of like I had my crap everywhere like I had so much stuff and I, I knew from last year I was like I got packed so many different things so you never know what you're gonna need um so like we there was some time between events to not not necessarily between events but like um um just throughout the day to at times to go back to our rooms and just kind of have some quiet time but you know we're all yeah if you're waiting you know if you're at the we, the we did go to different locations for each of the events so it's like we're hanging out in the vans we had these big vans like together and like you're either getting warm staying warm in the van or just cheering everyone on and I loved that about like I don't care how big of a competition or what's at stake like I'm going to be someone who's going to cheer on oh. the people beside me like that is just the like you know at the end of the day we're all out there on the playing field enjoying a competition that we got invited to that you know is in this beautiful area and like what an experience to just get to 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 do something like this so like for me it's just it's so much about enjoying the experience for what it's for what it is um it's still a competition i still get that you know, very competitive drive when it's go time. But like, if I'm not competing, I'm going to be cheering on the person to my oh, left yeah, and right. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and so, so before you get into day two, we had talked a little bit about mindfulness and you living in the present moment, something you experienced during Ram. Did you apply any of that with intention during the race? Like, cause to me, that perfect event is like, oh, I'm getting anxious. I recognize I've got adrenaline dumping because I'm, you know, like those examples, like when, Hey, when you're last, you know, now you know what the race is and you start problem solving all those things and your mind gets involved in the race when you're not even competing, yeah. like learning. And I, I didn't learn until way later okay. to kind of suppress that stuff and breathe and not focus about it. Use visualization to calm myself down. Were you applying some of those things? hundred yeah. uh, percent. I think for the, the, the military past, um, event with the, um, with the six different components. Like that was something where it was like, I, you could not s jump ahead because you had one thing to do for the pull-ups, you know, anything can happen. I'm very confident in my pull-up ability, but it's like, I need to focus on, you know, on getting, reaching a certain amount of pull-ups and then, you know, doing as many reps as I can from there. Okay. Check. Got that. Now it's push up or, you know, now it's push up time. Now it's sit up time. And like just checking one box at a time. I think we were all very nervous about the swim, especially the underwaters because the vis visibility was zero and, and the, 
water was so cold. Um, How did you know you made it to 25 and, meters? Because it's well, we the wall. Like, had a can we really had guys hit their head well, against the wall. Like, and our, cause our, yeah. We're like, what is this? You know, they're like, oh, there's poles out there. But we're like, uh, there's a hundred percent chance I'm not swimming in a straight line when I got there. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, 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 there's no visibility. So what they did was they actually had a rope tied from one pole to the other and you were allowed to pull yourself along it so it wasn't exactly like us like you still had to keep you know you still had to hold your breath but it wasn't um like a true swim so the boys came back and that's what i was going to say earlier the boys came back from doing that and all the girls like we're about to go in like five minutes so we're just like how was it and everyone's just freezing and they were they were like make sure you know wear gloves if you can because that rope's thin and you know slippery and it's, if you can have good contraction that's important but then they're like and just kick with all your might because at first i'm thinking oh you got to stay calm like don't want to use up all this energy but they were like nope it's not that long <laughs> they were like it's so cool like i think i think some of them tried it without kicking and they were and, and they just you know they weren't moving very fast because it's just i don't i don't really know maybe that maybe that wouldn't be the I, best strategy I'll, I'll give you my layman's guess did. at it for what it's worth like, even though we're on a podcast is that like <laughs> when you hit that cold water your body shunts all the blood to your core to keep your your muscles yeah. so you think oh it's much more relaxed to use my arms but if you don't have any oxygen getting to those muscles, you're now ultra taxing a system that's not prepared for it, where your legs, right, so much more muscle and, and ability to kind of propel you versus and using the leg, the arms to guide you. So I'm guessing you had some yes. coming back, you're, right? Well, that is exactly, well, I'm so glad because I, I was, I was, I mean, the, the water was up to our chest, so it wasn't like over our heads. So we could stand, so we were walking, wading out to where that was. And I just remember I was, we were just freezing. And then I, the boys had said, make sure you go underwater before shock. you do your yeah. first breath hold because you know, shock me. So I was like, oh my gosh, okay, here we go. And I went under and I came up gasping for air. I was, so, it was just like, you know, I was wearing like a neoprene, um, um, thankfully a neoprene swim cap. And w by the time, like when all the water just kind of seeped through all the cracks, I was like out, like I, my breath was just taken away. I was like, and that's where that fear and that doubt crept in big time there. And I was like, oh my God, like there's, there's just no way. Like I couldn't even fathom going back under the water to dunk myself under again. I was just like, I, I'm going to freak out and come back up. Like, so, so there was so much going on in my head at that moment. And, and it was terrifying, honestly, that was like, it was terrifying. You know? <laughs> and I was just like, I like, how am I going to do this? Um, but I did my breath, my breath work before and I, you know, big diaphragm breathing, um, got a little bit, um, you get a little bit mm -hmm. hypoxic with mm -hmm. it, right? When you're doing, I don't know, I, my, my brother and my husband helped me with some of like the breathing protocols that they do for longer breath holds. And so, um, I was doing my breathing and I was just like, you know, I didn't write myself off. I was just like, you're just going to give it your, you're going to give it your best effort. And, um, and you're going to, you know, you're going to focus on your breathing and you're just going to, you're going to do what you can. And so I got on that rope and I pulled and I kicked with all my might. And I, you know, I was just tried to stay focused and calm and not thinking of like, not thinking panicked thoughts. Um, and I remember the judge who was like, you know, who was standing, he would say, okay, like when you, when you got to the end, and you could feel the end, but he was just telling you of when you could officially pop up. And I remember him saying, like, you got this printer. You're so close. And I could hear him above the water. Because we weren't, we were in wetsuits, so we were kind of buoyant. So we're, like, toward the top of the water. Our head Summer had to be whole time, yeah. pretty much fully submerged. But I was like, oh, my gosh, I can hear him. Like, I'm almost there. I can do it. Like, I fought that urge to come up. And I touched the end. And he's like, you're good. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, you know, it was just, like, the best feeling where I just, uh, where I was able to overcome that. And then it's like you know, then you have a, like a minute or two recovery and then you got to do it one more time. And so I just remember like that was talk about confidence, right. Or, 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 and, and self-doubt or, and like trying to be in this headspace that's going to promote, you know, a successful, <laughs> a successful mission or event. Like that was, that was terrifying to have that doubt creep in very suddenly right before go time. Um, 
and I'm just, I'm glad. I mean, I'm and then you overcame it though, which is like that's the critical mass. Yeah. And that's, you know, we, you know, we trained right. a failure in the SEAL teams for a reason, you know, um, make things harder than we ever think it. We can see it in the real world so that when we're faced with these sort of otherworldly, then, you know, circumstances that you don't let that self doubt creep in. You're like, I got this. And that's, right. you know, unfortunately, yeah. you're in an individual event, right? totally different game for someone like me like i always had a shooting partner i always had a team or a squad or somebody there to support mm -hmm. um but man when you're facing mm -hmm. those things those demons alone that's a much different that's a much different yeah. environment for those unknowns yeah but it's like hey i'm gonna i'm gonna reach i'm gonna grab this rope i'm gonna put my head under i'm gonna pull and i'm gonna reach out as far as i can so like having these steps of like this is what I'm going to do. And like, and then I'm going to do it again and I'm going to do it again until I hit that thing. Like I think having like being very focused on a couple things allows me to, uh, allowed me to, to actually make that happen instead of like panicking and not having anything to put my focus toward. Then it was just like, all right, well, I'm just waiting for, for me to come up for air. So it's just like, when we have these things to, to put our mind to, I think that is so necessary and so important to, to keep out, to, you know, you're almost blocking out all the, you're blocking out your haters. You're blocking out the things that, that you don't have room for in yeah, your head. That aren't that's what makes people. you a champion. So, so you go back, you've got your roommate there. Yeah. You're trying to rewarm. Uh, are you, are you feeding yeah. yourself? Is there some catered, you know, food throughout the day or? They had, um, the school was kind of set up like a camp. Like they, had, like, so if you think about, like a ski resort, you have all these buildings and then, you know, the little cabins, we were staying in cabins off to the side. So it was decent. I will say sometimes the stairs leading up to the, like the little cabin area where or the cafeteria area that we had it in, like, because we're at altitude, I'm coming from sea level. Like the end of the day, you're walking up the stairs, you're like hopefully changed and bundled up and then you're one more obstacle. These five flights of stairs are really getting me, but um, no, they they provided uh, they provided all of our meals for us, which was great. They had snacks, they, they did a great job with um, with keeping us fed. And and for me, it was like yeah, totally game changer from 2014 when I didn't know how to feed myself. It was like knowing that, especially at altitude too, and the amount of um, competition that we're doing, the amount of activity, just it's it's a calorie game, right? It's just trying to get in as much calories as possible, and then eating things that are gonna sit well with your you know, sit well in your stomach but for me it was just like i know i need to eat more like you can't rely on your appetite to 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 consume enough calories in those instances so it's like oh you have some off time and like you have a, you have an a two hours of free time you better be eating something or you better be drinking or something sleeping. Or, so know, that's what so. I was, so i mean i know for me big events or competitions i always slept like crap before you know, I'm like, I'm yeah. anxious, I'm excited, all, whatever, whatever those emotions are dumping into me and my mind's racing. And I'm used to trying to turn my mind off, but I find I always had trouble sleeping. So now you're in a multi-day event. Yeah. As, as you know better than I do, yeah. sleep is really critical, you know, to your ultimate performance. So what was that sleep regimen like for you? And, and did it maybe get better throughout that, that course of the competition? You know, it, it really... Um it really was dependent on the briefing the night before and what events were planned for the next day. So like, um, for day one, for the night, the night before the first day, I, I didn't, I didn't sleep well. The second night I slept really well. Exhausted. I don't know if it's because it was from, I was just so exhausted and cold and like fine. Like, yeah, you know, after being cold for so long, um, warming back up. Like I slept like a baby that night, but I, you know, but then like for day, um, you know, for the third day with the, like, it was just really dependent on how, how the events were set up. If it were like, if it was a single elimination, like one chance to do this kind of deal or like a high stake event or one that I'm just like, Oh, I don't know how I feel about this. Or like, I don't know what my confidence is like, you know, I'll wake up naturally a couple hours early and my heart rate, like I will just think about the event. I'll get nervous and I'll have butterflies in my stomach and my heart rate will get so high. And then I have to go through the process of bringing it down and thinking about things I can control and you know what I'm going to visualize. And so it was like this constant pattern of like letting myself freak out a little bit, but then, okay, trying to cut that off and be like, okay, well that that's enough of that. Like I don't need to, 
and I'll, I'll, I can get into specifics with the wrestling event. Like that was exactly what happened. But I just remember being up at four and I had two more hours that I could have slept or maybe an hour and a half more. And I just was trying to think, I think the less we know about a certain area. So like wrestling, for example, like I'm not a wrestler. I just wrestled my brothers in passing or like in childhood. And it was nothing formal, but I think the less we know it's harder to visualize because I don't really know. And I was trying to think about all the things that my brothers and my husband were like, I knew there was going to be a wrestling event ahead of the day. I knew that that was probably going to be a repeat from last year. So we did some like little grappling work and just working on the position things. But when you're totally new to something that is actually like, you know, has a lot of technique or potential technique to it, it ends up just they, all the things just like fly around your brain. Like, okay, I'm supposed to do this in this scenario. And it, and when really you just need to be feeling it out. And I think that's what gave me more confidence leading into that event was getting with some of the guys there who had some wrestling experience, you know, head to head or cheek to cheek and having the hand on the back and then just like feeling, you know, you know, feeling their momentum, their positioning, and then just relying on more instincts of like, okay, where do I move here? What would be a good way to use their body positioning against them? So like, that was something I had to feel out. So I didn't really feel very confident in that until I was able to get a little hands-on practice either the morning before or that night before too with some of the guys. So, um, so I'm really grateful for that practice because I didn't want to be entering the ring against, and I was up against a pretty buff girl. She had a couple extra, um, she had, she had, she had a couple extra pounds and like, you know, she's just a bigger, beast of a crossfit individual games athlete and so luck of the draw I, we we were all drawing names the night before like, oh so you even knew going, going to bed who you're going up against and they're like we're gonna do it right now like okay everyone you know has a number karina you're like your number you know like, and so you pick you pick your number and it's like okay karina you're up you're up against number eight number eight is oh like meg um blanking on her last name but I, like meg and so i'm like oh great literally of all the girls here that was probably the one that i was you know i was feeling confident in my wrestling compared to the other girls I, I, but up yeah. against Meg, i was like great single elimination so if you get eliminated on that first round so four four people were gonna get eliminated right off the bat um and then there was a point system so like two of those people would get a zero and then, you know, you might get eight or 10 points, depending on how long you stayed in. How many else. points were scored against. Yeah, stuff like that. And so, was this day so, two? Was, was the wrestling? Like, this was day three. So now, you know, you're sitting in a position by day three where you're like, okay, I either need to move up or I need to. At, at the end of the day, you always want the most points as possible. And so the thought of like, wow, I could just for the luck of the draw. And depending on just how this one 90 second match goes, I could literally get a zero or I could end up, you know, with 25 points. Like the thought of that and the implications it has on your, on your point system and your placement is huge, especially by day three. So that was very nerve wracking. <laughs> I mean, I, I know for a lot of people, I've, there was a lot of people that were nervous about that because of just, especially on the girl's side, because of lack of wrestling experience but but just the single elimination just only getting one shot is also See, and, and that un uh, air quotes here unequal pairing excuse me that's the time when i would use some mental tactics against my opponent if i knew the night before i would have walked up mm -hmm. to meg and be like hey meg just so you know i have zero i have zero um wrestling practice and i'm just telling you like don't expect much from me i'm going to be the best competitor i can be but just don't expect for much from me Totally downplay my game, uh -huh. knowing that, like, because then I can throw Meg off balance when all of a sudden, whoa, this isn't as easy as I thought. I, I'm look, for, I don't want to know the outcome. I want to watch it. Uh. <laughs> no, and I won't tell you that. I won't. I won't allude to that. But you know what? I kind of adopted this for the first time because I'm kind of the same way. Like, kind of downplay it, be like the the dark horse, where you're like all of a sudden they're like, oh damn, like she's pretty good at that, but because everyone who competed watched the previous year's wrestling, like I watched all the episodes. And so I did pretty well last year in the wrestling. Um, but there was just this, this girl faith who was just a, a beast and, and she was definitely a bigger, stronger powerlifting girl. And so she just took everyone, but like, you know, I was, I fared pretty well in that event. 
And so I kind of adopted the, a, a different approach. Everyone knew I was kind of like excited about the wrestling. And so I was like, I wanted to show, like Meg wasn't, I knew she was a strong girl, but you know, it doesn't mean anything from a wrestling standpoint. Some people just really don't like the one-on-one -on -one physical contact. And so I was the one who was practicing a lot with some of the other competitors, especially the, the, the guys, the bigger guys. And so I kind of, I was like, let her, let her see me do that because I want her to get in her head like, oh shit, like even though she's smaller than me, like she's going to come Gracious. at me and like, she's got some moves up her sleeve. She's the movement. So I, I yeah. kind of took that approach. I think it worked because I didn't see her kind of really doing anything. And I was like, well, I'm not going to be in this position where I'm just like, yeah, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I was like, I'm going to try to use this time between when we got briefed on what this event and when we actually when it's go time to get as much practice and, and movement technique as possible, because I don't yeah. see any of the other girls doing it. No, and it's only sure. going to help me. And it's only, and, you know, I mean, I have a wrestling it. background. I was not elite level at all. Um, but you know, that the approach that you guys are taking to wrestling, it's all about center of gravity and women are much better at it than men yeah. naturally. Um, so knowing that component of it, if you can address and you know, your size actually has less to do with it um, in that regard. So Sure. Well, and I didn't even explain to you the rules. So you had 90 minutes or 90 seconds um, and it's all stand up grappling. So if whoever, if, whoever touches the ground, if you touch the ground. Oh, I thought you had to get out of the feet, pit, but it's literally, if you get the person, if you, if you do no, a takedown. If, yeah. So, if you the yeah, ground, okay. so it was all takedowns. Um, so that was definitely a different element. Like if you were the aggressor, we had a ref who like, you know, was, was, um, you know, very well versed in wrestling and so um you know if, if you were the aggressor and you took someone down but you like you know your elbow hit first or your side hit first the other they're still going to give yeah. you the point um you know of the takedown but you know but it did change things like you know if you were the aggressor but like you know if you're coming at someone and then they just pull you forward and you touch the ground it's like well like that's you know that's where the strong person, the stronger person, if that's, not that's smart where my it, tactic and, is like a little you know, tempo technique of like use the opponent's energy and weight against yeah. them. Um, that's, that would be what I would try and do. Right. So right. So that was, so like I said, I think I picked to be fair, like I think Meg and I were a great matchup and it's hard when it's something like draw and then single elimination, like that could have been the championship, like that could have been for first and second, but instead it was, it was the deciding factor of like who moves on to the final four and who wow. drops to the bottom. So that was, um, so that's why I wish like, and they just didn't have time to do more. They were like, cause I, I at first I was like, or I mean, I, the whole time, like they knew the staff knew, I was like, I'm, I really don't like that. This is single elimination. I feel like it doesn't give the athletes a chance to really find a placement that that's worthy of like your, yeah, you know, especially if you get eliminated by somebody who's and, way uh, behind in the points from you. This is, this is, oh yeah exactly so they um they were just like we just don't have the time to do so let's let's more. leave day two is our surprise episode um and so was there another event on day three besides the wrestling yes yeah, so wrestling was in the morning and we had a mountain bike event in the evening in the afternoon and it was so awesome we we <sighs> took the chairlift up to the top and it had we had like a 10 mile course in th three laps came out to 10 miles and then at the start line they told us instead of like we were all thinking okay we finish on our third lap and they're like the finish is actually at the bottom of the mountain so you guys are going to ride down an extra four miles of downhill mountain biking to get to the finish and like I was ecstatic I think some people like who weren't very avid mountain bikers were a little bit nervous but it, it turned out to be like the most fun event for pretty much everyone because it was beautiful out and the course was amazing and it wasn't super techie, but it was just a good time. And then to finish one four, like most of us were going to ride down anyway at the end. Cause they were like, yeah, you can ride, you can ride the trails down to the finish. Oh, line. I can't but, even imagine. Cause um, if memory yeah. serves me correctly, I think big bear was the first mountain in the U S to adopt like lift service mountain biking. So they probably have some of the most established oh. trails and everything and everything out there. If I remember correctly, it really kind of evolved exactly. out of there. And that's yeah. where like the first Epic races were those six cyclists that go like 60 yeah. miles an hour down, you know, those rocks. It's that's awesome. Well, it was a blast. I had a very eventful race though. So, um, in, to make it a long story short, um, I basically, <laughs> my seat <laughs> fell off during the race, <laughs> but who needs a seat? 
for oh now, but I'm just kidding. But I mean, so so it was. So I was borrowing a friend's bike, and they didn't even provide you guys bikes. They did, but you could bring your own. And I was driving and I was like, well, I bike all the time. I want to take mine. But I was talking to my friend Michaela and I was riding with her um, a couple of weeks out. And I was like, you know, I've had my bike for a while. I don't like, it's a good bike, but I, you know, if I had a chance to, to like do a, like to rent a nice demo bike, like I would. And so I was like, hmm, what, what, what do you think I should rent for this event? And she's like, honestly, you should just take this bike. And it was the one she was on. She's like, you should just take mine. I was like, but really so she she gave it to me to use for this event so i you know so she basically gave it to me and we swapped seats because my butt was used to my seat and she wanted to use her seat and so i was like it's not a big deal it's just like you know we'll swap seats so i swapped it taylor my husband helped me put it on before i left it was all secured took it to the event well when i got to the parking lot on race day or i knew you know right before we were about to take the lift up i was like you know what my seat feels like it could be pushed back a little bit like i feel like it's a little bit of a, a different position than i'm used to so i took the tool out i loosened it up all stuff loosened it back with my fingers just to check to see if i liked that position got totally oh, sidetracked <laughs> and forgot to even grab my tool from the bench i forgot to it didn't even tighten it with the tool i just had loosened had tightened it with my fingers and i went right up the lift Martini is so mad at I you right now <laughs> oh my gosh i'm i'm so mad at myself but so i left my tool on the left my tool on the on the bench i brought my bag up which just had like extra shoes and stuff and i'm clipped in so i like the clip-ins and i've been comfortable with that so you know doing my practice laps or practice riding up before um the event started i was so excited got off to a great start and um the lap was only they were like 3.3 mile laps so it was like pretty short um and we had three of them and it starts off with this awesome downhill very rocky but not super technical just like you know you're just you're just going over a lot of rocks and um so you know i'm flying taking off on this first lap and going and i finish up my first lap and come through and um you know got a decent lead but from the person behind me and um and then I start on the second downhill, I go the second lap and I start and I hear this like kind of jingle. Um, and I'm like, Oh, she's like, what is that? Like, is that coming from my, like, what is that? What, what part of my bike is that? And I'm like trying to look down while not crashing into trees and rocks. And I'm just like, Hmm, I don't know what that is. And then my seat started getting loose and I was like, Oh shit. Like, this is not good. Like it's my seat. And then I go back in my head. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I never tightened it. Oh my gosh, you don't have my tool. So I pass this section where one of the staff members is at. And I was like, hey, can you call to the, can you t call to the start line and just say, I'm going to need, a, I'm going to need a, a tool. I said, I'm going to need the star wrench. I don't know. <laughs> I just, I'm going to need the star wrench. It's like, cool, got it. He went on the radio. Um, and then, and I continue. And then my seat's really jiggling, like re sliding back and forth, left and right. Then it, just cock eyes. It's just like caught like the seat, one of the bars connecting the bottom to the little plate at the top of the stem just slips off. So now I'm sitting sideways and it's like <laughs> the seat is just totally only hanging on by one bar. And I was like, so I hopped off and I'm like, gosh, I don't have that much time. I don't know when the next girl's coming, but I'm going to like try to put it on. And I was trying to do it and just trying to like, I could not, I was so I was so anxious and like there was so much going on and I just, I, could, I couldn't get on. So I was like, you know what? F it. I'll ride, I'll ride with it sideways. Like it's not a big deal. As long as my butt can come down on something. That's not a seat I'll, post. I'll ride <laughs> cock on. Yeah. It's not a seat post. We're good. Well, 10 seconds later, the entire seat comes off. So now it is a seat post. And I'm like, great. Like I've, I've lost parts by this point. Like little screws of just I'm just hearing like these jingles hitting rocks I'm like oh my gosh I stick my bike seat in my pants so I, just, I have this photo and um, it just shows my bike seat just stuck right in the middle of my bike shorts just just waist down and I'm like well like nothing I, I've got two-thirds of this lap still to go and there's no one that can help me so I'm just gonna just gonna go so i just stood up thank goodness i was clipped yeah. in because there was just it started with downhill but then the rest of that lap is like is pretty climbing and like a little bit like it, it was it was fairly mellow but there was still like 600 feet of climbing and so i was just standing up in the saddle the whole time my legs were so pumped 
and I came through and as, as I'm passing the photographers, I'm like, I'm going to need a mechanic. Like, can you get me a mechanic or call in and ask for a mechanic when I come by? Like, we got to do this fast. Um, so I come through, I'm like, where's, where's the mechanic? And like, like they this weren't is even the ready Spartan for me. race, like, you know, bicycle like, mechanic. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they were like, well, we didn't know a girl, like who was. And then anyway, so, and we didn't know what they were saying. They were like a seat. So I was like, yeah, well, the seats came out. I was like, okay, um, can I, can I get a new seat? And so, or can I, can someone help me put this on? They ended up taking a seat off of, like, one of the guys had a DNF because he had an injury from the wrestling the day before. So they took his bike seat, and they're, like, undoing it. And meanwhile, I'm just freaking out because I don't know how much time I have between me and the next girl. And I, I knew it probably wasn't that much from the first lap. And so I since I took a lot longer on the second lap without a seat and stopping, I knew that that had probably dwindled. So I'm freaking out. I'm like, oh, my gosh, if if I see – like, I need all the points I can get, right? So – um. So I'm freaking out a little bit while they're putting that on because they're taking forever. And I just see this pretty blue bike lying down by the start line. And I was like, whose bike is that? <laughs> and it was one of the airmen who was helping out with the event. He's like, oh, it's mine. It had like the GoPro on it. And he was just, he brought it because he was like so stoked to like ride around and help out with the event and then do the downhill after. I was like, can I use it? I was like, oh my gosh, can I use it? <laughs> and he's like... He was awesome, Alex. Same um, pedals? Did he have the same uh, type of uh, clip-in pedals? <laughs> no. So he had flats. So I'm, at this point, I'm so frazzled. I'm like, I got one more to go. I can't lose the spot that I'm in. So I just take off, and i am got my clip-in shoes on his flat pedals, and I'm sliding. At first, I'm like, I don't even care. Like, I'm going to go and just do this lap. Oh, at first, I was like, you know what? just give me my, my bike. Don't care about the seat. I just need to get my lap in. Like I, I'm going to do it without a bike seat. And they were like, no, 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 you you need a bike seat. And I was like, damn. So then I found that blue bike and I was like, can I have it? So then I like about, to, I'd taken off. I've had like five pedal strokes in and I'm like, wow, this is going to be terrible if I ride with my clip ins. And I had my backpack up there with a pair of shoes. So I like threw off my shoes. I'm like, someone's helping me put on one shoe. I'm putting on the other. They're tying that shoe. I'm tying this shoe. Like this is so, I've never been more frazzled, I think in a situation in recent times than that. I, and then I grabbed the bike. I just jet out of there and didn't see a girl, didn't see that girl come up behind me. So I was like, thank goodness. Cause if she saw that, even just having, you know, if you know how close someone is like on a course like that, you're not yeah, seeing the, see you know, even the person's fair close, heavy, yeah. you're not going to see them. So that's a huge strategy. Like I just didn't want anyone to know that I was that close to them. Um, so I just took off like a bat out of hell and I just, and it was a really nice bike. And so, and I like, yeah, this dropper post. So I just adjusted it to my height and I had the most fun lap. I was cruising and this bike was, like I said, it was just top line. And, so was, um, and then I got to take it on all the way down. Like, so the next lap we, we finish up the three laps and then we just send it on the downhill. And I crossed the finish line huge smile on my face. I'm happy with my placement. And the next girl crosses in, she, what was the time? She crosses like, Oh my God, that was close. I kid you. She yeah. never saw me, but she was, I think or maybe, maybe it was like 50 seconds. It, it was, it was not much, but like, you know, the grand scheme of things, I was like, Oh my gosh, this could have been so crazy. Like if I had waited for them to put on the seat, like it just would have been. And meanwhile, you really owe so, that airman because, uh, you know, I'm sure I his bike was time. more than a pretty penny. And I'm also sure he was very much looking forward to riding that bad boy down. To <laughs> yes. I you know I was talking with that. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I took your bike. But he's like, no, I found uh, the other bike that I was going to use the seat of. And, like, I just rode that I one down. It. it was a blast. But thank you so much. So anyway, he's close. He's, he's, uh, he's near and dear to my heart for having done that. But um, yeah, so that was, a, that was, it was a very fun day with the wrestling and the biking, but it had its, like I said, my heart rate was out of the roof on the wrestling and then with the biking. It was yeah, really but there's an opportunity, like, right? As a competitor and a champion, it was a near failure that you overcame through your mental awareness, your acuity and your determination, those great, all those things. And also, right, we call it failing forward, right? Or first attempt at learning, the acronym fail. And I guarantee the next time you have an event, it doesn't have to be a bicycle, but an event that has any component outside of you you're going to be going over that thing in a much different way and probably already have checklists and all those other oh, things yeah. like, okay, equipment check, right? Bam. Yeah. 
there's always, especially like you said, especially when there's equipment involved. So, um, awesome story. So yeah, that was that was fun. Oh, there was there was a third test that day. There was a third event. So in between the wrestling and the mountain biking, we had a pacer test, which was um, which is like the middle school beep test. There's a high school. I have my children, right? They do that. They've done that test since they were in elementary school, and they would always come home from. My kids were always good at it, naturally. I mean, they would always talk about this pacer test. I'm like, what the hell? We didn't have that when I was in school. And so I got to watch. I watched a little bit of that coverage on Instagram of you guys doing the pacer test. And I was like, that's what it's about. Uh-huh. Yep. And it, boy, does it get fast. Yeah. It gets fast. And it's, again, you're gaining so it because you like you have like, so much right, time to get it. to the one side. And so you kind of start walking, you know, or going at a slow jog. But you, you don't want to get eliminated, right? So you're always trying to, to pace. Your, it's right. literally you're pacing yourself for that. So right no it was um that was it, it wasn't it was fun i mean it was um i mean it was just like the longest yeah. suicide you went through but anyway it was it was cool it was cool to see some of the top finishers with just like wow like respect to those individuals who especially you know the guys especially too um you know just looking so cool calm and collected for so many levels just and and getting it up there so and of course like you know this is day three of a competition that's the building, day two was very um, running intensive, and so we were pretty pretty gassed by that time. And then um, and then day four was the was when they so the night the the night of the third the third night they introduced the the mystery event, which was the tactical one where we'd be shooting and doing. We actually did real dummy drags. So like the airmen who were there, they um, at first we were going to have a dummy, and they were like, "Well, why don't we just why don't they just." carry us or drag us and so they were like and so spartan staff was just like okay um so they got all dressed up in their kits and everything and it was it, so it was cool to do that but it was fun like it was fun to learn kind of a new um you know the shooting Have you ever done any tactical competitions before no never done any so i saw you so. pick up the airmen you know, and he did a good job of playing dead or limp, which is like, you know, that dead weight is way harder than picking up a dummy. I mean, a dummy's hard, but when you have a live human being yeah. that's not, you know, responsive, it's like, it's really hard. And right. your technique for picking him up was flawless. Like, really- well, thank you. Well, I have my brother and husband to thank for that. Crossing those legs, crossing the arms, arm pulling them up over your shoulder. I was like, dang, yeah. somebody taught that girl straight. <laughs> 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 that was a that was very fun i really enjoyed that event like from the from the you know yeah actually carrying a person i mean they were supposed to be a, you know they weren't supposed to be totally dead they're supposed to be you know a casualty so i think he did a good job of of being dead like dead weight but you know not like if, it, if he were yeah. actually playing dead it would be incredibly difficult but um i mean that being able to to fireman carry that 215 pound guy with his weight vest on was what allowed me gave me a leg up in that event because I was not going to be the fastest my shooting was not going to be the best so I had to make up ground when where at all possible and um you know so so we had three carries it was like um we had three carries with um shooting 10 10 rounds of you know target practice in between each one and then you know you get docked points for every miss 10 seconds for every miss. And then if you like didn't put the safety on or we had to follow a very specific like gun handling technique. And so we'd get docked X amount of seconds for mishandling. Um, And so like, that was really cool. And and just, you know, getting a little bit of practice beforehand, we didn't get a ton. We probably got like 10 shots with it beforehand. And then we're like, okay, go time. And now your heart rate's elevated. And um, so that was, that was really cool to just kind of be thrown into that and be like, wow, okay, well, like here, here we're, here we are, we're gonna, we're gonna do this. Um, that was really cool. And then at the end, we put on a 50 pound ruck for girls and then a 70 pound ruck for guys. And we ran up a half mile up this, it was probably 0.6 miles up. And so it ended up being over a mile, but we rucked up this heck of a steep hill. Um, or mountains inside and then ran it back down as quickly as possible so like it was it was uh I mean it all in all it took about I, I think it took about you know 15 minutes 15 to 18 minutes for most people um with the shooting and the dummies and the drags and carries plus the plus the ruck but 
man, it was a good, it was a cool combo. I'm like super psyched. I went, the biggest thing I left with that in terms of like wanting or having a desire to do something new was yeah. that tactical and, event. And maybe, yeah. And I have some of friends of ours here in the Virginia Beach Pungo area that I was in bicycle racing with and they're really, they're a great family here. And they've been getting into the tactical sports, you know, and they're in my age, they're a little older than me. Oh. They're in their probably mid fifties, I guess. And it's so much fun watching this couple, like go out there, compete and do all their stuff. It's like, it's inspiring me to be like, okay, I've been retired long enough. Maybe it's time for me to start getting my shoes. Yeah. Get yeah, back out yeah, there, Bob. Cool. <laughs> no, it, but a lot of respect to just be able to like, it's it, at that point, it's not just, it's, it's so much skill and heart rate and breath control and or just overall body control and with tied into the combination of you know physical physicality and fitness like it's it's um you know they're then they're so completely different so it was just really cool to 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 combine the two and get a, a chance to really like um try some try yeah, that out their operator and, tests and like the great the thing that like any time that i designed a monster mash i think other than my retirement which just ended up being a run swim run but anytime i designed a monster mash i always wanted at least one or two shooting components in it because that's the champion mindset because mm -hmm. you're an event inevitably you're going to drop a shot and it's like do you drop that shot and forget about it and get back to your fundamentals and correct? Because, you know, for us, there are big penalties. You know, if you dropped a shot, it was usually 30 seconds up to a two minute penalty, depending on the length of the course, right? We wanted to like, hey, accuracy is what we're driving here because that's what we're paid to do. And so like you drop a shot and you would watch people if they let it get inside their head. The next thing you know, everything blows up, their whole race crumbles. But then that champion drops a shot, goes, dials back in and boom 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 hammers nails that's like that's what you want to see I know. it's so cool because yeah you can get frustrated and then it's like well and 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 what you know when it comes to something as fine-tuned as like accuracy and pre precision it's like that is absolutely yeah. going to play into well, so i will ask, so, ask you about anyway, the I results just, I, we'll let the listeners um you know watch the show uh it's going to be on youtube with spartan races yeah, I think I, I'm pretty sure that's it's gonna be. Um, you know, if you just link in the show notes, I'll, I'll, you know, and I'll show how to. Well, cool. you can link last year's like Spartan Games, and then yeah, then the new one will should have should have that link up. But yeah, it was just a it was a great experience, and and I wasn't able to do a ton of racing this year as much as I um had had wanted to or had anticipated, just with a lot of other things going on, and um, but I it was very cool to end my year my season with that uh with that event and just um getting fired up for for next year and kind of like i said adding some new ideas to maybe what i'm trying to challenge myself in yeah and so what are you looking forward to in 2022 like what's the what's the if you have a goal already carved out for you, i'm sure that's what you're going to spend the next few weeks over but yeah yeah exactly this is definitely that time to really think about what where i want that focus to be but um you know with with my husband being in the navy and um you know twin brother in the navy um and just having so much fun in that tactical event i really would like i really would like to um develop like a new skill um you know with my mark some marksmanship and and work on that and just and and i think you know guns were always something that kind of freaks me out and I kind of just stayed away from because I I think it just came down to just feeling unsafe yeah, around. I didn't with know yeah. what I was just doing. Just like a chainsaw. You know. Like if you've I'm not used to it, working well, with a chainsaw, you look at it and somebody hands you yeah. a running chainsaw, you're like, God dang, this is scary. Exactly. And then you, you know, you you don't know what you know, how the other person who's who's handling it around you, like, you know, they know really what they're mm -hmm. doing or if they're sick, you know, that's you know, it's it's so so for the longest time, you know, I've done, I've done some skeet shooting and like, I'll do, we'll do some target practice with my brothers and over the years, that confidence or that, that, um, you know, familiarity has in, increased a, a little bit. And so it became like, you know, for this event, by the time I got to this event, it was like, and being around more military oriented personnel who, you know, and, and, and just being more confident in my own kind of, um, knowledge and understanding of some of the some of the protocols there I, it just like it just got me more excited than anything to to maybe learn more in there because like when you learn more you know what you're doing you know how to handle things dangerous things in a capable manner now it's 
now it's, you know, again, it's that confidence and, you know, and it doesn't become scared you anymore. And now you can actually use it, you know, in self-defense or, or, um, to do something that now, now gives you a, a new capability in, in some other area, right? It's like, there's so many applications for it that, um, you know, and, and so, and so I just like having overcome that kind of fear or, or, um, mm -hmm. just that shyness toward anything gun related to now, like, oh no, I, like, I want to be empowered to learn what I'm doing and, and know what I'm doing here so that, you know, in an, in an emergency or in a crisis or in like certain scenarios, like I, I, I can, I can be that, I can step up and, and actually defend myself or, you know, X, Y, and Z. So I, I, I have reached a point where I'm just like, would be really excited to to learn more in that area and i know it's, it's going to be part of a lot of the, the training that my husband's going to be going undergoing over the next few months and so it's like why not <laughs> join him in that or like make it make it be something that we can Very both cool. learn more about um so so yeah so i definitely want to like i would love to do a tactical games next year and um kind of explore a little bit more of that scene um of course if i would hope that they continue doing the spartan games so like the good thing, the nice thing about that is it doesn't, I, I didn't train for it. Like I didn't train specifically for it because I just, you know, I, I run, I swim, I bike, I lift, I do a lift. I do all these odd objects and like military style training. And it's just all a part of what I love to do on a, a over the course of a given week. So it's, um, you know, and, and I, and I really like being well-versed in so many different areas. So if there's an area that like, Oh wow! I wasn't very good at that, or like I've never really done this before. It, it in, encourages me to learn more or yeah. do more. Well, of that you are thing. you are in a class of your own from female athletes I've met and worked with. Like you are well rounded, and um, like I really look forward to seeing what you do next. Now, in the meantime, are you, you are you doing you know nutrition and diet you know dietitian work with athletes, and you ha are having clients right now? Yes, I am. So that's, um, so that's my, that is my soul, like my main focus outside of training, but based off of what we've talked about, you would, it, it kind of you sounds like I'm yeah. just like a full time yeah. athlete, but I'm not. No, the majority of my days are, you know, working as a registered dietitian. Um, I have my own private practice for, uh, remote, remote work with individuals on, um, on their nutrition, whether that's for, just lifestyle, just healthier lifestyle or weight loss, or, you know, I, I do have quite a few athletes that I work with on performance nutrition. So I really enjoy, you know, there's so many things I've learned over the years through personal experience with my racing and, and athletic pursuits. And then of course, a lot of my schooling. And so it's just fun to not only have had the opportunity and continue having the opportunity to, to apply that to my own, um, you know, my own pursuits as an athlete, but then to apply that or, or to help others apply that to their sports, whether that's just recreational or they're, you know, big time professional athletes or, or operators or just anyone in the, any servicemen and women in the, in the tactical field that are just trying to, you know, hone in on their performance and health. So, uh, so I really enjoy working with people and, um, and and bringing better nutrition strategies to so their is there everyday i mean lives. i'll put everything in the show notes but it, how do people find you if they want to follow you on instagram or you know on any other platforms you're on yeah, or if they have nutrition absolutely. questions or whatnot totally i i'm pretty I'm, I'm fairly active on instagram so that's probably the best social media um site so cs coffin 13 is my instagram handle and that has my website um linked to it in the profile but um the rd athlete is my dot com is my website and so you can i have lots of people reach out to me over instagram or through my website um but i'm always always happy to work with work with people regardless of what their their um their nutrition goal is so it's just it's and that's why that's why I really love working one on one with individuals because everyone's unique. Everyone has, you know, it's I I get so sick of seeing these generalized nutrition concepts just plastered for the masses to follow, and it's just like, well, that's really not. That's, yeah, that's, so that's, that's not how. That's not the. And I've managed my own stuff outside of some you know um, consultations I've had while I was in the SEAL teams. But I'm definitely at the area now, you know, I'm going to be 50 next year if I start training for some events that I'm not used to, you know, within the cycling stuff, I've got that dialed in really well. 
Um, but man, anything that we're, mm-hmm. we're talking power and, you know, or burst efforts and things of that nature, or getting rid of my extra five pounds at 50, I've, I've seen to acquire over the last decade or so, like I could definitely use some tutelage, I may be reaching out as a client. <laughs> but... Bob, you're crushing it. You're crushing it. I, I, hey, we should, it would be fun to, it would be fun to see you out on the on the race course at a at a tactical games event you can teach me you can teach me a thing or two about marksmanship and i'll help okay. you with your own All right, course. Deal. <laughs> <laughs> corinna this was so much fun thank you so much for joining us and good luck to you in the future and my best wishes to you and your husband and your brother and the rest of your family um and the next time you come out to virginia give me you know a few days heads up and maybe we can get together i'd be happy to drive wherever your uh your family's farm is out there and spend some time with you yeah. Thanks, Bob. I was, it was a joy chatting with you and having this opportunity to be on your podcast. So thanks for having me. Thanks for the invite. And I definitely look forward to meeting up in All person right. sometime Same here, soon. Corinna. Cheers, everybody. Until then, we'll see you on the other side of the microphone. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Victory Podcast, where we explore life, leadership, and journey. Please follow us on Instagram at the Victory Podcast, as well as LinkedIn and our website at victorystrategies.com, where you can also follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn. Have a phenomenal day, everyone. And until next time, I'm your host, Bob Newman, telling you, all right, all right, have a phenomenal day. tune in to the previous episode if you haven't given it a listen yet. Cheers.